If there are no further points of order, I shall in a moment call Keir Starmer to make an application, colleagues, for leave to propose a debate on a specific and important matter that should have urgent consideration under the terms of Standing Order No. 24. The Right Honourable Gentleman has up to three minutes in which to make such an application. Sir Keir Starmer. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, for allowing time to hear this application for an emergency debate on the following motion, that this House has considered the matter of the length and purpose of the extension of, article, of the Article 50 process requested by the Government. I do note that the SO24 procedure requires a specific and important matter to be before the House, and I think there could be few more important than this, Mr Speaker. Last week, the House passed a motion by a majority of 210 requiring the Government to request an extension to the Article 50 process. The Prime Minister voted for that motion. The wording of the motion itself and speeches from that dispatch box, including from the Minister for the Cabinet Office, led the House to believe that the Government would seek either, on the one hand, a short technical extension if the Prime Minister's deal was passed by the 20th of March today, or a longer extension if that was not the case. Parliament could not have expected the Prime Minister instead to pursue a course described at that dispatch box by the Minister for the Cabinet Office as downright reckless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yet today we learn that is exactly what the Prime Minister intends to do. The Prime Minister has now made a formal request to the President of the European Council for an extension of Article 50, but she has not made a statement to this House. Therefore, the only opportunity for Parliament to debate this issue before the Council meets tomorrow is by this SO24 application. It is vital that the Prime Minister and the Government are held to account on this, that we have this opportunity to scrutinise the Government's approach, to consider the terms of the extension that are being sought, and, if this approach, uh, by, uh, and to ask whether this approach abides by the will expressed by the House last week. I therefore ask for this emergency debate to be held at the earliest opportunity. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, I am grateful to the Shadow Secretary of State for exiting the European Union. The Right Honourable Gentleman asks leave to propose a debate on a specific and important matter that should have urgent consideration, namely that this House has considered the matter of the length and purpose of the extension of the Article 50 process requested by the Government. I have listened carefully to the application from the Right Honourable Member, and I am satisfied that the matter raised by the Right Honourable Member is proper to be discussed under Standing Order No. 24. Has the Right Honourable Gentleman the leave of the House? No! I say, uh, colleagues can now resume their seats as much for the benefit of those observing our proceedings so that they are intelligible. But there was an objection, I think, from the Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Wellingborough. No, no, I heard it very clearly, and, but I think he probably wants everybody to know the Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Wellingborough, objected. And in those circumstances, it is necessary for at least 40 Honourable or Right Honourable Members to rise in their places if you will, to validate the application. And it was very obvious to me they can do it again if they want to exercise their <laughs> knee muscles. <laughs> it is entirely obvious that the Right Honourable Gentleman has indeed obtained the leave of the House. It is commonplace for such debates to take place the following day, but it is by no means required that they should do so, and I have on a previous occasion, because of the circumstances, ruled that the debate should take place straight away. This is such a circumstance. The debate will be held today as the first item of public business. That is to say, after the 10-minute rule motion. The debate will last for up to three hours, and it will arise on a motion 
that the House has considered the specified matter set out in the Right Honourable and Learned Gentleman's application. I'm grateful to him and to colleagues. Order. We now come to the debate to take place for up to three hours under standing order number 24. I call Sir Keir Starmer. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, for granting this debate. It does provide a vital opportunity to scrutinise the Prime Minister's letter to the President of the EU Council and, of course, the wider government approach to seeking an extension. But, Mr Speaker, on an issue of this importance, this shouldn't have to be dealt with as an SO24 application. The Prime Minister should be here to answer questions. It should have been a full statement to the House. I appreciate that we had PMQs earlier, but this is a very important decision about the future of the United Kingdom, and the Prime Minister should be here to make a full statement, setting out why she's applied for the extension she has, and to answer such questions as there are across the House. It is symptomatic of the way the Prime Minister has actually approached very many Brexit issues, which is to push Parliament as far away as possible from the process. Mr Speaker, this House has rejected the Prime Minister's deal twice, and not by small margins. It has voted to rule out no deal, and it voted to require the Prime Minister to seek an extension of Article 50. I obviously appreciate that the Brexit Secretary's last words at the dispatch box on Thursday were, I commend this motion to the House, before, before he promptly went off to vote against it, which, which has caught, caught me slightly by surprise. But no doubt, uh, I, 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 he's probably rather hoping we don't divide this afternoon. Um, but, but given where we got to, given where we got to last week, ruling out no deal, requiring the Prime Minister to seek an extension of Article 50, in the intervening days, one might have expected the Prime Minister to reflect on where we're at and to recognise, as my right honourable friend from Doncaster North said earlier, that perhaps she is the roadblock to progress. She could, at this stage, act in the national interest and frankly show some leadership and take a responsible approach, which I think would be to seek an extension to prevent no deal and provide time for Parliament to find a majority for a different approach. I think many members are yearning for that opportunity to move forward and to break the impasse. But the letter, I'll give way just one moment. The letter to President Tusk makes clear that that is not the Prime Minister's intention. The letter says, and I quote, the UK government's policy remains to leave the EU in an orderly manner on the basis of the withdrawal agreement and political declaration agreed in November. The letter continues, it remains my intention to bring the deal back to the House. Not a new deal, not a change deal, not a deal or compromise or position agreed by this House, but the deal back to the House. It doesn't speak of seeking time for change or time to consider other options that could win support in Parliament. The only mention is of domestic proposals that confirm previous commitments to protect the internal market given concerns expressed about the SPAC stock. So there is nothing new, it is just the same deal to be brought back as soon as possible. Uh, I will give way. Thank you, Honourable Friend, for giving way. He's making a very powerful speech about the real predicament we're facing at this present time, the real crisis. Um, there's been indications from the Government of France that he may well not permit an extension to Article 50. So, faced with that proposition, does he not agree with me that the Government's in a real fix here? Unless they meaningfully change the deal that's on offer to Parliament and bring it back urgently, then the Prime Minister's going to be faced with a real difficult situation of either rev rev revocation of Article 50 or crashing out with no deal. Well, I, I do understand the difficulty. I, I don't think it's really appropriate for me to respond or, or to comment on what may or may not have been said from, about, from heads of state about what may or may not be agreed tomorrow. The point I'm making is about the expectation of this House uh, about the approach the Prime Minister would take and the even greater expectation, I think, um, as I say, a yearning. I can feel it across the House. I could feel it last week that this House be given an opportunity to break the impasse for itself 
by finding a way forward. Um, and the Prime Minister's approach, I'm afraid, is the same old blinkered approach, which is all I'm going to do is to seek time to put my deal back uh, exactly the same before the House for another vote. I will give way. I'm extremely grateful uh, to him for giving way. And based on the Prime Minister's letter, I'm not entirely clear why the EU would grant an extension in the first place. But the question for all of us is to what length he would uh, deem an extension and for what purpose? What's the policy of the Labour Party? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I am going to come on to that, but the, the, the point I make um, is really this, that um, the period should of course be um, as short as possible, but it must be long enough to determine the purpose. In other words, the purpose has to determine the length. And one of the mistakes we've made in the last two years, and we've been struggling and challenging the Prime Minister on is if you let the clock dictate rather than the purpose dictate, you end exactly where we've ended now. The, I, I will give way. Uh, and does he agree with me that it is uh, absolutely ridiculous to suggest uh, that the idea of participating in democratic elections uh, this May as the main reason yeah. for this House yeah. or this nation not doing what is in our national interest is complete nonsense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful, and we, we touched on this last week. In re if, if, well, um, I probably need to answer the first intervention. Let me deal with the first intervention first. There is the difficulty of EU elections. We discussed last week um, what the legal position is. Um, and what the political position may be, and we need to bear that in mind. But I think of greater importance is that, given that we're discussing the future of the United Kingdom and its relationship with the EU, that we take time to find the purpose of the extension um, and a majority that the House can get behind so that we know why we're seeking the extension. And that will begin to answer the question how long an extension um, should be for. Uh, I will give way. I thank friend for giving way and I, I, fully, I fully agree with his last point in this. And the problem really is that the EU negotiators have actually said that it was, would have to be significant changes before they would look at an extension. And the problem that we've got, certainly on the back benches, and I'm sure my honourable friend does, nobody knows what the Prime Minister is going to ask the EU in relation to that extension. Does he not agree with me that this is disgraceful for the House to be kept in the dark in this way? Well, I, I think the, the problem with the Prime Minister's approach is this that we voted on a motion last week that said she would seek a short extension if a deal was passed by today. And it's not been put before the House today. That was paragraph two of the Prime Minister's motion, that she would seek a longer extension um, if that wasn't the case. So there was an expectation that the Prime Minister would do the opposite of what she's done today. But equally important, there's a growing expectation that this House needs to have time to decide what happens next. And a different Prime Minister might have reflected on what happened last week and come this week to say, I recognise my deal is not going to get through as it is, and I, the Prime Minister, will provide a process of some sort or ask the House to help me with a process of some sort to decide where there is a majority so that we can move forward. Um, and it's that that's, that is what is being missed uh, by this letter. I will give way. Uh, as ever, the right honourable and learned gentleman makes a powerful speech. He's given an explanation, he, rather, he's given a description of what he would have expected the Prime Minister to do in all the circumstances. What explanation does he put forward as to why the Prime Minister hasn't behaved in that way? Is it because she is stubborn or is it because she's in the, in the, in the pockets? of the ERG, the hard Brexiteers who are essentially running this country, running this Brexit process. What does he think the explanation is? Well, I'm, I'm grateful for, for that intervention um, because my, the immediate concern is the Prime Minister doesn't appear to be acting in accordance with the motion, her own motion of last week. But the deeper problem is this, and this is what I am most concerned about, that the Prime Minister still thinks that the failed strategy of the last two years, namely my deal or no deal, a blinkered approach, no changes, no room for Parliament, should just be pursued for another three months. Yeah. That in other words, all she's going to do is use the three months in exactly the same way to bring back the deal 
um, over and over again, or as many times as she can, um, without breaching the rules of the House, um, and to try to force it through. That, I'll just finish this point, if I may. That is the strategy she's been pursuing throughout these negotiations, and it has failed badly. And what we must not allow to happen is just another three months to use up on the same uh, approach. I'm just going to make some progress, and then I will give way again in just uh, a minute. The, the letter uh, sent by the Prime Minister this morning makes two requests to the Council that they approve the documents agreed in Strasbourg on the 11th of March uh, and then allow three months for the Prime Minister to get the same deal through Parliament. And I think, Mr Speaker, if I've read and understood the letter uh, properly, uh, that the Prime Minister may be planning to bring the deal back on the basis that the documents that were before us last time have now been approved formally at the Council and that there are some domestic arrangements uh, that have been agreed with um, possibly other parties, uh, uh, and then say, well, now the deal can be put to another vote, notwithstanding the fact that the documents on the table are exactly the same documents as we voted on last week. Um, and obviously that will raise an issue as to whether that's in accordance with the standing orders of the House, which will have to be addressed um, at the time. I, I will give away just a minute. Let me complete this point, and then I will. The, letters, the letter com uh, continues. Um, it remains my intention to bring the deal back to the House, not a new deal, um, but uh, the same uh, deal. And that is extraordinary uh, in terms of the way the, vote, the, the House voted last week. It doesn't reflect the motion that was passed. Um, it was clear that, um, as I say, paragraph two, on the one hand, a short technical extension if the deal was passed by today, that was when the Prime Minister had the intention of bringing the deal back for today, or a longer extension if that was not the case. Uh, I, I, I will give way. I thank the Honourable and Learned Gentleman for giving way. He said a few moments ago that there was no point in asking for an extension, particularly a long one, in the absence of a clear purpose. I gather from those remarks that he thinks a long extension is appropriate. Could he confirm that? And if he does, could he tell the House what his purpose would be? Uh, as I indicated earlier, I'm going to get to purpose in a little while in my speech. I will give way. I thank the right honourable gentleman for giving way. And I wonder if you could clarify something that he, he appeared to me to say just now, which was he said that the Prime Minister was not following her own motion because she had said in the third part of it that she would seek a longer extension. Reading the motion actually doesn't appear to say that. The first part says she will seek an extension. The second part says that if the deal go had gone through by today, she would seek a short extension. And the third part merely notes that if the deal didn't go through the extent and, an, and an extension was, a longer extension was sought, that it would require the European elections. She did not say that she would seek a longer extension. And I'd be grateful if you could clarify that for the record. Well, I am grateful for that intervention because it allows me, Mr Speaker, to read uh, what the Minister for the Cabinet Office said on this motion from this dispatch box. Uh, on his, he, 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 he was promoting the motion and he actually voted for it, so maybe what he said may be taken uh, seriously. What, 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 he clearly, what he clearly was saying to the House was, in the absence of a deal, um, uh, uh, and what he meant by that was a deal going through by today, he said this, standing there last week, a short and critically one-off extension would be downright reckless and completely at odds with the position that this House adopted only last night, making no deal, a no-deal scenario far more likely rather than less likely. The words from the government's benches on the interpretation of their own motion. In other words, if a deal hadn't gone through by now, Minister of the Cabinet Office saying, um, in those circumstances, simply to go for a short one-off extension, downright reckless, and makes no deal scenario more likely rather than less likely. Uh, uh, and, and members in this House ought to be concerned about that. I will give way. I'm very grateful to my right honourable friend for making a powerful case. The motion that the House agreed made it clear that if there was not a deal by today, then the likelihood would be that the European Council would require a longer extension. Is it his view that when the European Council meets tomorrow, that is likely to be what they will ask for, what they will require? Well, we'll have to wait till tomorrow to see what their response is. It may simply be that they will consider any request, but they do need to know what the purpose is. Um, and this is where the Prime Minister may get into some difficulty, because if she says the only purpose 
is to allow me to keep putting my deal for the next three months, um, then that may or may not be seen as realistic in terms of what's going to happen in the next three months. But it's, it is a question that Prime Minister will have to... Yeah. I'm going to give way and then I will give way. I'll give way twice. I'm grateful to the Right Honourable and Learned Gentleman for giving way, because just going back on his point, it's apparent, and he may agree with me, that the remarks made uh, by the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster were not being made just sort of out of the air, but in order to explain and justify the Government's wording of that motion, which came in for a considerable amount of criticism as appearing to be opaque. So he may agree with me that the words uttered at the dispatch box could be taken authoritatively as the government's assurance about what they intended to do. Well, I, I do agree with that, and, and I think um, the reputation of the Minister of the Cabinet Office in this House is of someone who, um, it, that, in whom others do uh, invest assurance and confidence because of what he says and the way that he says it. I also think that there may have been um, the sort of preparing for the meaningful vote coming back this Tuesday with the message that if you don't vote for it next Tuesday, uh, then the government is going to have to apply for a, slight, for a, for a different um, extension. So there was at least that dual purpose. No, I did say I'd give way and I will. Okay. Uh, of course, the emphasis on his word short is, is very subjective because for many people, short is long and long is short. And if he is... Well, clearly, by definition, it's pure, it, it is by definition subjective. Now, perhaps he is comparing one statement of short compared to another statement of long. But even in that case, it is purely subjective. Well, I mean, I, I suppose I accept the prophecy that one, one person's short may be another person's long. But. Um, but, but the debate, the, the words of the Minister of the Cabinet Office weren't sort of in isolation, out of the blue. They were in the middle of a, quite a heated debate at times about the motion, what it meant, and how we should interpret it. And I don't think, I don't think, I don't think in all honesty, I will give way in just one second, I don't think in all honesty anybody who was in the debate would doubt what the Minister from the Cabinet Office was actually saying and what he meant by it. Uh, and I'm, I took him to mean a short and critically one-off extension meant an extension for uh, up to three months with a cliff edge at the end of it. And that, that, was, the, it, it, that was how the debate was uh, going. I will give way. I, um, I thank him for giving way. Doesn't he find it extremely regrettable that the strategy that this government has now is to bamboozle everybody so nobody knows now what was meant, said and so on and so forth and is that not extremely regrettable in the case of such an important nation that, uh, issue for the nations now? Well I certainly agree that it's not the first time that we've passed a motion which most people voting for it thought was pretty clear only to find out that what it means is disputed within a week. I will give way. Very grateful to the right honourable member. Is he as confused as I am, given that we hear from the dispatch box assurances from the government and the Prime Minister that they know the will of the people and it has been decided? If they are so sure, why are they so fearful to asking people yeah, again? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that's really a, a, a question for the government, but my, my point is that whatever... Uh, we, we have to find a way through this impasse. And that requires us to come together as a House and to consider what the options are and, and vote on them and to provide a process for that. I don't think simply putting the deal that's been rejected over and over again with differing threats um, is really helping. And what, what the Prime Minister... Mr. Uh, well, just a minute. What the Prime Minister has done, Mr Speaker, on one view, is having accepted a motion last week to take no deal off the table, is trying to put no deal back on the table within a week. Um, just changing the date of the no deal so that she can then ram the deal up against the deadline again with the old no, uh, my deal or no deal. And I've no doubt there'll be a running down of the three months as we get closer and closer to the June deadline with exactly the same strategy. And that's the great cause for concern. I will give way. Uh, I thank my honourable friend for giving way. Does he agree with me that it's absolutely outrageous that the government should be bringing back the same deal just a week later to ask MPs whether they've changed their mind yeah. when they refuse completely yeah. three, almost three years later yeah. to give the public yeah. the opportunity yeah. to see yeah. their yeah. mind. Yeah. 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 
Uh, well, that, 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 that's a very powerful point, and I think the idea, I mean, the argument we were making last week was that realistically, um, the deal hadn't changed from the first time it was put eight weeks earlier, um, and. Um, there was obviously the suggestion that the government was simply going to bring it back this week and not even pretend there were any changes, but just say it's now a week further on. How do you like a different threat? Um, and see if they can get it through. And that is what has to, that is what has to uh, stop. I will give way, and then I'll give way again. I thank uh, right on, uh, right on and learned gentleman for giving way. Um, I'm not sure if he's aware it's I International Happiness Day today, apparently. Uh, and would he agree with me that perhaps one way of making both sides of this House happy might be for there to be a, a, a people's vote uh, on the Prime Minister's deal with the option to stay in the European Union? And then we'll all be happy, including him. Mr Speaker, I'm not sure how another day where I'm at this dispatch box uh, and we're here uh, discussing Brexit could be considered a, a happy uh, day by anybody's, uh, 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 in anybody's book. I, I will give way to the Honourable Leader. He's been very generous, Mr Speaker, with the interventions, and I'm sure he's aware, though it may have escaped his note. Mr Speaker, paragraph 562 of Hansard on Thursday, the 14th of March, when indeed the, Duchy, um, of the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster also made it very clear in his opening mark, remarks about what the purpose of the government's motion was. And as the Honourable Gentleman has already told us, the, the, the Chancellor made it very clear that, he would, um, that this motion was to deal with the event of this House approving the withdrawal agreement and a short extension, and then he goes on towards the end of that column 562 to say, and if that, for whatever reason, that proves not to be possible, we would be faced with the prospect of choosing only a long extension. So he has said it more than once, and the purpose of that motion was extremely clear to this House. Well, I think it was, I really do think it was clear to anybody who was in the Debate, and I think the Minister for the Cabinet Office also went on at least to hint that if the deal did not go through this week, um, he at least would be open to some sort of process uh, by which the House could come to a different agreement and move forward. Um, I think he indicated that that would be next week, and of course on Monday we um, are due to um, vote and possibly amend the Section 13 motion um, that the Government has to lay um, as a result of the last meaningful vote well, we'll failing. Um, I will give way. I'm grateful to my honourable friend giving way. Does he agree with me yeah. that it's not about the length of the extension, but the function yeah. of the extension? Yeah. Yeah. And therefore, the EU will need to see either a change <laughs> in the process, i.e. a vote of the people of this country, or a very different deal moving forward, because the Prime Minister's deal clearly is dead now and cannot come back to life. Well, I do agree with that, and I also think that it isn't very seemly for the United Kingdom to have a situation where a deal is simply put and re-put and re-put and re-put, and if it eventually gets through by just a few votes after many times of trying, with threat levels changing. That is, no, that is not a proper basis for the future relationship with the EU. Um, and it loses all credibility that the meaningfulness of it is, is sucked out every time this process is repeated. Mr. S no, I'm going to make some process, Mr. Speaker. I, 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 I will give way in a moment, but I, I really do think I should make some, um, some progress. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, we're now acting in the absence of a deal um, with the express will of this House to prevent no deal. Um, and one of my biggest concerns today is that the Prime Minister's actions make no deal far more likely, not less. And that's the very issue we were trying to deal with uh, last week. <laughs> if agreed to by the EU, a short extension for the purposes of forcing through this deal would simply push the cliff edge back to June the 30th, and we would start down the same track. Um, and, you know, the, the Prime Minister is repeating the same flawed strategy that she's been pursuing for two years to try to recreate the binary choice between her deal and no deal that this House rejected last week. Obviously, Mr Speaker, I, I'm just going to make some progress and I will take some intervention. Obviously, after last week's debate and voting as we did in last week's debate, we, we recognise that an extension to Article 50 is now needed and it's the failure of the Prime Minister's approach that's caused that uh, requirement for an extension. Of course, any extension should be as short as possible. 
but it has to allow a solution to the mess the Prime Minister has got the country into, to provide a route to prevent no deal, not to make it more likely, and it has to provide a way for this House to prevent the Prime Minister forcing the same deal on us over and over again. That's why we believe the focus in coming days and weeks should be on finding a majority for a new direction to allow the House to consider options that can resolve the current crisis. For Labour, that centres on two basic propositions, a close economic relationship with a permanent customs union and single market alignment, and a public vote with credible leave options and remain. And they need to be discussed. Those propositions need to be tested, along possibly with other propositions, and we need to come to a consensus to see whether we can move forward. That is what extension should be about, not about the narrow interests of the Conservative Party and trying to keep the Prime Minister uh, in post. Mr Speaker, thank you again for allowing the debate today. I look forward to hearing the Minister explain the Government's approach and how it plans to prevent Parliament from going back to the same place in three months' time. Thank you. Order. The question is that this House has considered the matter of the length and purpose of the extension of the Article 50 process requested by the Government. I call the Secretary of State for exiting the European Union. Secretary of State Stephen Barclay. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It's always a pleasure to follow the Right Honourable and Learned uh, Gentleman. Um, he started his remarks by saying that the Prime Minister should be here uh, to answer his SO24, but then slightly oddly went immediately on to note that the Prime Minister had been here for just under an hour answering questions on uh, the extension uh, in particular. Uh, and indeed, if one takes it together with two urgent questions to my department this afternoon, an SO24 and much of Prime Minister's questions being taken uh, also on these matters, whether that, uh, well, in a moment, whether that constitutes, as the member for Carl Shorten and Wallington uh, amounts to International Happiness Day, uh, I leave for others uh, to determine. Of course, I'll give way to the Honourable Lady. The Honourable. The Minister might be wise, the Secretary of State might be wise to be aware of the fact that the Prime Minister's letter to Donald Tusk was not released until after Prime Minister's yeah, questions had started. And it wasn't released to this House, it was released to journalists. Isn't that the case? Well, um, I, it's always good to uh, take wisdom from all sources. And uh, in terms of the letter, my understanding was it was placed in the House of Commons library. Uh, the precise timing of that, I think, given the length of time that Prime Minister's questions uh, ran for, I think it probably was in the library whilst the Prime Minister was still uh, answering questions. But I'll, with pleasure, uh, to the Honourable Lady. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the Minister for giving way. But he has stood here describing how much time this House has spent talking about Brexit. But, Mr Speaker, that is not the problem. The problem is we're nine days yep. away from leaving, yeah. and the government appears to have no policy. Isn't that the problem? Yeah. Well, the, uh, the Honourable Lady is, is correct that the House has spent a lot of time talking. What the House hasn't done is spent a lot of time deciding. Uh, and what we have seen... What we have seen is what the House is against. Of course, I give way to the Honourable Lady. I'm giving way. There's a famous phrase that the definition of insanity is doing the same yeah. thing over and over again and expecting a different result. We've kicked this deal out twice. Historical precedent in this place says it can't come again. The EU has said they're not going to accept a, an extension unless something different comes forward. At what point will we accept that we've got to go back to the people to put an end to this because we can't keep going over yeah. and over yeah. again? Well, 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 I do wonder if the Honourable Lady is describing her own front bench's policy, because they have put forward a proposal that the House has rejected, uh, and yet seem to be intent on still putting forward the same policy. And if you speak to EU leaders, as indeed uh, the Right Honourable and Learned Gentleman I know will have done, uh, what consistently comes across from uh, senior figures in the EU is that the proposal put forward by the Leader of the Opposition is simply not credible. For example, uh, for a moment, for example, he thinks that he can retain control over state aid, he thinks he can have a say on EU uh, trade deals. These are things that are simply not on offer. Of course, I give way to the Honourable Gentleman. 
Secretary of State for giving way. He seems to be somehow sort of surprised that the House has been asking urgent questions today, has been seeking this debate, has been holding the Prime Minister to scrutiny, because this is the greatest crisis this country has faced yeah. since yeah. Suez. Yeah, yeah. Countries around this world are looking at us, our international reputation in tatters, yeah. our businesses losing jobs and investment day by day, we're paying millions of pounds down the drain that could be being spent on our public services. And he wonders why this House is asking questions? It's absurd. With respect to the Honourable Gentleman, that wasn't the point I was making. Of course it's right that the House answers questions quite rightly, Mr Speaker. You have always personally championed uh, the House asking questions. Indeed, urgent questions is something to which I think quite rightly you take much pride. But the point is, uh, I will in a moment, of course to the Chair of the Select Committee in a moment, but the point that the uh, Honourable Gentleman is not addressing is that people around the world also look to this country to respect it's democracy. They say that this House gave. They say that this House gave to the people the decision. Indeed, the government of the day, the government of the day, wrote saying we would honour that decision. And I think what uh, he chums us from a sedentary position, but I think what is damaging to our reputation around the world is a sense of us asking the people for a decision and then not acting. Now, of course, I give way to the honourable. I, I'm very grateful to the Secretary of State for giving way. Could he just explain to the House, uh, give an answer to this very simple question? The Prime Minister has revealed today that she has applied for a short one-off extension, and yet from that dispatch box, if we were already here, last week her de facto deputy described such an extension as downright reckless. Could he explain to the House what the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster was thinking of when he made that statement. Yeah. 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 Well, firstly, I refer the right honourable gentleman to the comments that my uh, right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, said on that very issue because she was questioned more than once at uh, Prime Minister's question. But it also relates uh, to the point that uh, his right honourable colleague, the right honourable and learned gentleman, said in his opening remarks because. At some length, he kept referring in the motion to paragraph two of the motion last Thursday. And the point about the motion last Thursday was it was conditional on a meaningful vote taking place, uh, which has not happened. What was also, just a second, because the right honourable gentleman, as, as so often, raises a very serious point uh, as chair of the select committee, but also, if you look at the comments from my right honourable friend, the, Shadow, uh, the Chancellor, Dutch Leader Lancaster, he was also talking in the context of what EU leaders uh, would be willing to give. And if you look at the public statements from EU leaders, once again they have said that there is very little appetite in Europe for a long extension, particularly when they see the uncertainty uh, that we have had in this House. Of course, I, have to honourable. I, I, I thank uh, the Minister for giving way, and he is very generous uh, with his time. But it was put to the, to, to the Minister just now that we have no plan. But the plan is the deal. And the only plan Labour have put to us is closer alignment with the Customs Union, which has basically staying in the EU and that's not what the people voted for. The people did vote to come out and all this obs obfuscating is only delaying that and would he agree with me that we have to consider business and the longer we dispute and discuss and debate and the less we come together the more difficult it is for the economy and our businesses. Yeah. Well my uh, honourable friend is right to say that business is in Taunton Dean and I'm sure elsewhere in the constituency uh, have made clear their desire to see this deal backed, uh, their desire to address the uncertainty uh, that we face. Uh, and again, people have been saying to my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, that she should compromise. She has compromised. She, she didn't want to have an extension. She has listened and acted uh, on that. But the House itself has to compromise. Of course, I could wait to on what He's being very generous. Is it, is it not the case that the only way to avoid a no deal is the vote for the withdrawal agreement. The only way to vote ag against a long extension is to vote for the withdrawal agreement. A and is there not some intellectual inconsistency in the opposition's argument? And that is, they say they want to put a vote back to the people based upon a deal, but they're suggesting the Prime Minister doesn't really want a deal and wants no deal. That is not even consistent. Mm. Well, my uh, honourable friend is right in that the only deal, not just that the Prime Minister uh, says, but the only deal the EU themselves say is on the table after over two years of negotiation, uh, is the deal uh, that uh, she has negotiated. Uh, of course, I give way to the honourable gentleman.
I thank the Minister very much for giving way. He says that the House isn't very good at deciding what it wants, but we are crying out for the opportunity to vote for what we want. And he said that countries around the world are looking to us to respect democracy. Will he respect democracy in this House and give us the chance to vote on it now? Um, the, the right honourable gentleman says about uh, respecting votes and whether the House has uh, had an opportunity to vote on issues. His party uh, wants a second referendum, a people's vote, uh, and yet we had a vote on that issue last Thursday. Indeed, my uh, shadow opposite number didn't vote for uh, the people's vote. So, so the point is, if he's going to practice what he preaches, then we respect we had a vote uh, on the people's vote last Thursday. The House spoke on that. I give one way and then I make more time. So the Honourable Lady. Thank the Secretary of State for giving way. The Prime Minister has proven she is not prepared to give us the opportunity to consider alternative options in the light of the failure of her deal twice. She is putting us in danger of crashing out by the end of next week. And that means a real danger of food shortages, medicine shortages and potentially civil unrest because of the prospect of crashing out. Can the Secretary of State explain to the House whether his government, if, if that is the case, whether his government will commit to revoking Article 50 in that context? The, the Honourable Lady is usually one of the most forensic questioners in the House, but on this issue I'm afraid I fundamentally disagree, because firstly we have made very clear as government that we won't revoke, because we are committed to delivering uh, on the referendum result. But secondly, again, it's a slightly illogical charge uh, of, of the Honourable Lady to say that the Prime Minister is seeking to crash out uh, on the 29th when she has today sought an extension to the end of June. Uh, I give away once more to the Honourable Gentleman and then I will make some progress. I'm grateful to the Secretary of State for giving way. One of the reasons why we wanted the Prime Minister here this afternoon is because, whatever her shortcomings, we can at least trust that when she stands at the dispatch box, she believes every word she says, which cannot be said for the Secretary of State, who can make one argument in one breath and then vote in the other division lobby in the other. Isn't the case? The reason why he shouldn't be laughing this afternoon, because, by the way, people are laughing at him, not with him, yep. is because we are nine days away from crashing out with no deal. There is no sign of a plan from the government, and even the extension letter the Prime Minister submitted fails that basic test of explaining why an extension is required. Isn't the simple reason that there is no plan? If there is a plan, what does it stand? I think the Honourable Gentleman is willfully misrepresenting the way uh, that uh, the amendable motion played last Thursday, the fact that the uh, amendments were defeated and we had given a further commitment to our amendable motion uh, on the 25th. Uh, and perhaps his frustration uh, is displaced from his own frustration with his front bench, because, because what we haven't had uh, from uh, the Leader of the Opposition is clarity in terms of when a second referendum will be put. Now, Mr Speaker, I'm conscious that this is a time-limited debate, and uh, so I should make uh, some progress. Uh, we have requested an extension under Article 53 of the Treaty of the European Union until the 30th of June, as it's now not possible to ratify uh, the deal before the 29th of March. The request to the President of the European Council, delivered today by my right and friend, the Prime Minister, gives us a final chance to uphold the democratic responsibility to deliver Brexit in an orderly way. As requested, my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, has set out the intentions uh, of this government, uh, and that letter has been placed in the library. I'll, I'll give way once more, given its uh, right honourable gentleman. Very grateful to my right honourable friend. And would he confirm that we have had plenty of time to consider all the other options, and that throughout the EU withdrawal bill, uh, a lot of options were tabled and vetoed, and then again last week we had a series of indicative votes. I think everyone has been looked at, and the truth is, they were voted down. Well, the, my right and friend is right in the, the suggestion that this House has not had sufficient time, which is one of the points put earlier, self evidently does not reflect the extensive debates that we have held. The idea that the House has not had an opportunity to express its will when it has done so repeatedly uh, on issues, including last Thursday, is simply not credible. Well, given it as it's the uh, 
the, the Honourable Lady in particular, I, I should make some progress. I am conscious, Mr Speaker, well, no, that's I'm taking too many interventions, but for the Honourable Lady, of course. Thank the Secretary of State for taking a further intervention. He will know that this House has rejected the Prime Minister's deal now twice by historic margins. It's neither the will of the House nor the will of the public. And it's also rejected very resoundingly, leaving with no deal. But what we haven't yet had is, in government time, an opportunity to do just what the Right Honourable Gentleman asks, for the House to give an indication of what it would support. So will he support bringing forward the opportunity to give an opinion on indicative votes um, in the next week, preferably on Saturday? Um, well, uh, I'm not sure uh, on Saturday would be the most popular uh, of responses with, uh, with, with colleagues uh, across the House. Um, but we have given a commitment, as the uh, Your Honourable uh, Lady knows, to uh, a meaningful vote uh, on Monday, and obviously following that there will be opportunities for the House uh, to have their say. But uh, let me make some uh, progress. And Mr Speaker, any extension is the means, not the ends. But any extension of whatever length does not allow this House to escape its responsibilities to decide where it stands, uh, its commitment to deliver on the decision it gave to the British people, or whether it is going to walk away from doing so. Nor should any extension uh, mean that a guerrilla campaign can be run to overturn the result of that referendum and frustrate the will of those who voted to leave. Uh, I disagree with, he's not in his place, but I disagree with the Shadow Chancellor uh, when he suggested that any extension should be uh, open ended. Indeed, I think his comment was it should be as long as necessary. Uh, and indeed, he uh, was at odds with his own front bench, the uh, Honourable Member for Islington South and Finsbury, who just the day before said that Labour would only back an extension to July because it would be inappropriate for us, Labour, to stand for the European Parliament. Uh, indeed, Mr. Speaker, an open ended delay would mean disregarding the votes of the 17.4 17 million people who voted to leave. We now need to use any additional time to ensure an orderly Brexit is delivered. The Leader of the Opposition has, said how, uh, has not said to date how long an extension he is seeking. I don't know whether the front bench wish to use the opportunity of this emergency debate to put on record exactly how long an extension they are looking for. Uh, yeah, I suppose, is, is, is the Honourable Lady going to clarify? what the Labour policy is on the length of its extension. I look forward to her date. Thank the Secretary of State for giving way. Um, the, the North East Chamber of Commerce have stated that their members do not want a messy and disorderly exit from the EU, and they are perplexed that the Government has given, allowed a no-deal scenario to be seen as a credible outcome, and they have asked that Article 50 to be extended for a sufficient period of time to enable the Government to fully engage with businesses and stakeholders to form a consensus on Brexit. Will the Secretary of State stop ignoring the will of thousands of job creators in the North East? What is, what is quite remarkable about that intervention is it is Chambers of Commerce up and down the country that have been saying back the Prime Minister's deal because they want the certainty that the deal offers. Uh, so I'm very grateful for her for bringing the House's attention to the voice of business, uh, but it's not a voice that usually gets much of a hearing uh, on the benches opposite. I do, uh, Mr Speaker, do note, however, that she did duck the challenge, uh, and indeed I've still not heard uh, anyone from the opposition front bench actually tell us how long an extension they are seeking. Well, we have, we have a volunteer. We have a volunteer. We look forward to the date from the Honourable World Gentleman. Given that, that it's clear from the historic votes we cannot agree the deal in this House, and given it's clear that the Government thinks that, that they're confidently saying they're actually displaying what the people voted for, surely they have the confidence to put that back to the people, in which case the extension should be long enough to be longer than the 22 weeks for a public vote, which is five months, of course. And so I would suggest nine months would be an appropriate thing to keep all our options open. Prime Minister Speaker is he's not even persuaded his own front bench of his own position because he is saying now that he wants, he wants a nine month extension. 
he's saying he wants a nine-month extension. And yet, and yet we don't have any clarity uh, from the bench opposite. He's further saying, he's further saying that he wants... Well, He's further saying that he wants time for a second referendum, uh, yet I've yet to hear clarity as to what the question would be. Would it be two questions or three? Would remain be on the ballot or leave uh, be on the ballot? Uh, and even, even if he were to... Well, I've given away once, and I think the Father of the House wants to come in, so I will obviously let the Father of the House in in a moment. But, but he, he, even uh, the question is unclear. The length of time it would take uh, is unclear, uh, and he can't persuade his own front bench of his own policy. My honourable friend, we're, we're suddenly wandering around the point here of how long and what for uh, we're having an extension, with both front benches, with respect, not being altogether clear. Uh, on the various basic facts, what is if the withdrawal agreement is defeated again? That can't be the agenda for any further extension. Uh, secondly, that the useful negotiations in Brussels are going to be very limited for the next few months because they're electing a new parliament and they're appointing a new commission, so you won't really be able to get underway till sometime in the summer. If we use that time for the British generally, parliament and government, to come to some conclusions about what we're pursuing, we're still going to see some time after that, and I'd have thought the end of the year is the very minimum time that's going to be read, that are needed to sort out this crisis in a sensible, constructive way from now on, which we haven't done this far. Well, the, 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 the Father of the House makes a, a very reasonable and well-made point, which is, and it's a point indeed I have made to some of my colleagues uh, who voted to leave uh, in the referendum, which is if they continue to fail to support a meaningful vote, then the House may opt for a softer form of Brexit. And I think that is a risk that many who campaign to leave need to be mindful of. Now, the equivalent risk to that, Mr Speaker, for those who may cling to that life raft uh, as a preferable option, is that it remains unclear whether the House would then ratify that given the way that the withdrawal agreement bill would obviously need to be passed, that is a major piece of legislation, and, and the sustainability of that coalition would come into question with the risk of a no-deal outcome subsequently. I give way to the Honourable Gentleman. Grateful to the Honourable Gentleman. Right, Honourable Gentleman, for giving way. Given that we will just accept that his favourite outcome is the acceptance of the Prime Minister's deal, if that can't happen, what's his second order of preference? I don't think he sounds very much in favour of extension. We have then have the possibility, the only two sovereign choices, the only two independent choices we've made here are no deal or revocation of Article 50. Which one would he go for? Over the cliff or turn back? Well, I forgive the uh, honourable gentleman for not having uh, listened necessarily to uh, various media rounds where I've answered that question already on multiple occasions. So if you take it to its absolute extreme, uh, and I think I've been very clear that I think both outcomes, no Brexit, I think is hugely damaging democratically, and I think a no deal outcome is very damaging economically. No, well, he chooses that. Of the two, I think no Brexit is more fundamentally damaging to our country, and I have made my view clear. Now, that is notwithstanding also being clear that no deal would be economically disruptive, but I think would also have difficulties for our union, not least because the Honourable Gentleman would seek to exploit a no deal in terms of a future Indy referendum. Now, I think both outcomes are undesirable, but as the Prime Minister has repeatedly set out at his dispatch box, there are only three outcomes. However much Parliament might want to kick the down, can down the road and delay this, there are only three outcomes that we can have, which is either no Brexit, no deal, or to back the Prime Minister deal, which the EU themselves have made clear is the only option. Now, Mr Speaker, I'm conscious that uh, I give way once more and then I'll wrap up because I'm conscious of time. In his last speech in the House, the Secretary of State commended a government motion to us, and then he went and voted against it. Will he explain to us what on earth he was doing? <laughs> of course. Well, again, we touched on this in, in various media rounds I did yesterday. So the point was, if you look at the entirety of my speech, all of my speech except the final line, was addressing what was the substance before the House that day, which was the amendments, and in particular the amendment from the chair of the exiting the European Union Committee, which would have taken control of the order paper away from the government, which I happen to feel, and the government felt, was not just 
just damaging to Brexit, but constitutionally significant. And as the right honourable gentleman will know, we won the government won that vote by two. There were three votes. It, what was reported was that the conclusion of the speech was quickly followed by a vote. What actually happened was the amendable motion was defeated. Uh, the three amendments were defeated, and it was only at that point, following a commitment to a further amendable motion on the 25th of the month, that the Chief Whip was in a position to change the Whip. So it's not just my view that changed, it's actually the Chief Whip's and the Government's view. Well, he turns us away, he asked a question, he's getting a straight answer. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm conscious we've uh, given quite a lot of interventions. So, three years after the country voted to leave, Parliament continues to order. Point of order. Point of order. Sit down. Point of order, Barry Sherman. Almost uh, surreptitiously, the Secretary of State announced a couple of sentences yep. ago yep. that we were going to have the next meaningful vote on Monday. Yes. That has not been announced in this House. I had no knowledge of it. And the fact that the Father of the House has been making sensible suggestions how we can together progress what we want to get out of the deliberations, which are going to be confounded by the fact that the meaningful vote is being brought to Monday. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, uh, perhaps I should just say, uh, my understanding. Uh, uh, order, say. Well, uh, we'll hear the right honourable gentleman in a moment. My understanding was that the Secretary of State had specified a meaningful vote on Monday. I thought he used the words meaningful vote, but I may be incorrect, and the right honourable gentleman can clarify. It is certain. Order. Order. It, is cer order. it is certainly the case that we are due to have a motion pursuant to earlier resolutions of the House and that it is due by Monday and I believe it is listed in the remaining orders. My expectation is that there will be such a motion on Monday. Perhaps the Right Honourable Gentleman could helpfully clarify to the House precisely what the Government does intend for Monday, assuming that it knows and what it does not. The Secretary of State. Very, very happy to, to clarify what I was referring to was the uh, amendable motion that the Government has committed to give and I refer back to the remarks of the Chancellor of Duchy of Lancaster who made uh, that commitment and that is uh, on the record in Hansard. Uh, Mr Speaker, three years after the country voted to leave, Parliament continues to break the manner in which we should leave. Uh, while some, having stood on a manifesto to respect the result, work tirelessly to frustrate that decision. The EU have repeatedly made clear that after two and a half years of negotiation, the Prime Minister's deal is the well, only point of order, order. I'm sorry to have to interrupt the right honourable gentleman, but if there's a point of order, I'm mistaken. Point of order, Mr Stephen Dowd. I'm sorry to interrupt, Mr Speaker, but I, I'm afraid I'm not satisfied with that, and I wondered whether um, it was possible to, to check, given that the importance of that in the relation to the business next week, whether it was possible to check with the official uh, reporters with Hansard as to what the Secretary of State actually did say, because he, he said lots of different things at dispatch before, left the House in confusion, and there are all sorts of rumours swirling around about what is happening on Monday next week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it would be difficult to get it immediately, although those who take down what is said verbatim in this House do work extremely skillfully and conscientiously. It is therefore reasonable to expect that what was said will wing its way to the Chair before very long. Moreover, if the Secretary of State in any sense misspoke, and it is open to him to clarify what he meant. So, Mr. So, Mr. Speaker, I mean, if, if I did misspeak, then of course I'll apologise to the House and, and seek to clarify the record. I think the point being made was about a meaningful vote. That is the reference back. Uh, it was, uh, just another again, was about an amendable motion, uh, and so, so that was the point. And I think the Shadow, Shadow Secretary of State accepts that point. So we were, we were referring to an amendable motion. Of course, I give way. Uh, the Secretary of State is very kind, and I did put him up on the point of order because I did think I heard what he, he, he said. He did. But could he just uh, he express the, uh, uh, address himself to the concern the father of the House keeps bringing? Yes. 
that if we rush into this, we won't have time to do exactly what the father of the house has been saying, give us some objectives that then we know that we're going to Europe to say, in this extra time we have, this is what we think is achievable. This yeah. house could come together and do that. If we have an early, too early a vote, we'll have no chance to get our house in order and to do that. But the, the right one, you know, it's always very reasonable in uh, the interventions he makes. So first, uh, I'm grateful to the opportunity to clarify uh, on the record that it was the amendable uh, um, motion that I was referring to. But to the substance of his point, uh, then we will come up back on Monday and set out at the dispatch box uh, exactly how we will honour uh, the commitment that was given by the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster. And conscious, I've used uh, a lot of time, Mr. Speaker. So um, to uh, conclude. Uh, well, <laughs> I'm very grateful for the Secretary of State for giving way. Uh, the Secretary of State a few moments ago advocated no deal over no Brexit. That is wholly, wholly irresponsible yeah, and will yeah. cause huge problems in our communities for our businesses. And this short extension only pushes a no deal brick wall just a few months down the line. Will he confirm that he is not advocating no deal over no Brexit? Because that is not what we want. Well, what I'm advocating is a deal, because I accept either a no Brexit or a no deal outcome is highly undesirable. Um, but I think uh, going back on uh, the referendum result, going back on the Honourable Lady's own manifesto pledge at the last election, I think would be hugely damaging to our democracy and to public trust uh, in this institution. Uh, Mr Speaker, in seeking the short extension to the 30th of June, the Government intends to bring back the deal to this House as the best means of ensuring an orderly exit. If, however, the House continues to refuse a deal, or alternatives through other votes do not provide sufficient numbers for both a deal for ratification, then it is clear the House will need to decide between no deal, a softer Brexit, or no Brexit at all. Some members of this House may prefer a general election to no deal, which is why those of my colleagues counting on a no deal outcome are set to be frustrated. Others who think Brexit can be stopped through holding European parliamentary elections, uh, enabling further long extensions, may also find some members of this House uh, prefer other outcomes to that. The best way, Mr Speaker, of this House delivering on the will of the people in the referendum is to support the Prime Minister's deal, uh, and that is the way forward uh, and how the Government should proceed. Yeah. Order. Mr Peter Grant. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm grateful for the chance to speak in this debate, and I commend the right honourable member, the Shadow Secretary of State, for having secured it. Mr. Speaker, despite the protestations of the Secretary of State, and I can understand why, out of loyalty to his Prime Minister, he has to say it, the Prime Minister's deal is finished. Yeah. The Prime Minister is not going to get that deal through next week. The Prime Minister is not going to get any changes to that deal this week, this month, or even this year. The Prime Minister is now acting like a motorist who brings her car back to the garage week after week after week and then runs to the press expressing their frustration at the mechanic for refusing to take a decision to give an MOT. And it's perfectly obvious that what he's driving is a clapped out old banger that should have been consigned to the scrap heap yeah, weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, Mr banger, Speaker, yeah. an extra coat of paint on this deal is not going to make it roadward, but it should be scrapped. If there's going to be any attempt at a deal at all, it's got to be a deal that is reached in consensus by engagement Beautiful, with the whole of this House, including the 90% who do not agree with the Prime Minister's vision, where she thinks of what she thinks we are going to achieve from this. So the options we have, Mr Speaker, are a significant extension, and that does not mean for a few weeks or a couple of months. Complete revocation of Article 50, which then gives a future government the option is to further want to try again, or we crash out with no deal. And it was very noticeable that repeatedly today at Prime Minister's questions, the Prime Minister went through a whole litany of options that she was refusing to take forward because they had been voted down by this House. <laughs> none of them, none of them had been voted down by anything like as calamitous a majority as the yeah, option yeah, that she yeah, now yeah, determined yeah, yeah, to take back yeah. for a third time in flagrant violation of the traditions of this House, which, remember, was supposed to get sovereign to return to it by this whole Brexit yeah, fiasco. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So having failed twice to get a, a vote accepted by this House, surely it's time and well past time for the Prime Minister and her government to accept that it's not Parliament that's out of step with reality, it's the government that's out of step with reality. I'll give way. I thank the honourable gentleman for giving way. However, he, he does seem to be misinformed. Last week, this House voted down a proposal for a second referendum by 249 votes, which was a crushing uh, defeat for the, for the amendment and demonstrate there is not the support for a second referendum in this House. The the Mr. Mr. Speaker, one of the Prime Minister's own allies has just ad ad argued very eloquently why the Prime Minister's deal should also be dead in those circumstances. I'll give you in just a second. Okay. Parliament voted with 15 days to go to the cliff edge to ask for an extension. The Prime Minister quite deliberately used 40% of the available time to do absolutely nothing. Yep. Even when she made a statement on Friday saying she would now write that letter, it took her five days to write this urgently needed letter. What was she doing? Looking for a pen? Looking for a stamp? I could have given her either if she'd asked. I'll give you the Honourable Friend for giving way. Does he agree with me that we've heard repeatedly from across the floor that this government it has to follow the democratic will of the people, but does he accept that the 2017 election to this House represents the democratic will of the people also, as well as the 2016 election to the Scottish Parliament, which has yep. repeatedly and resoundingly called for this government to listen to Scotland, and it has failed to do so yeah. time and time again, and it fails to listen to this House time yeah, and time yeah. again? Yeah. 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 It makes a very, very valid point, and it is also, again, worth recalling that the only time in 25 years that the Conservative Party has had a majority in this place was when they stood in a manifesto to keep us in the single market and the customs union. And as soon as they stood in a manifesto to take it out of the single market and customs union, the majority vanished at Snorf, I think. I'll give you an I appreciate that very much indeed. Mr Speaker, um, forgive me, I think it's worth the House being aware um, that in the last five minutes Donald Tusk has confirmed that only a short extension yeah. would be made available if this House approves the withdrawal agreement next week. Now, clearly, that is not going to happen. So, uh, weaving into an intervention as I am, does the Honourable Friend agree with me that no more smirking at the dispatch box, here, here. no more playing games, here, here. no more poker about no deal? This government is in the edge of bringing this country down. Yes. No more. The Prime Minister must bring indicative <laughs> votes to this House as a matter of urgency and national imperative because the risk facing us right now, this withdrawal agreement will not succeed next week, is we are looking at no deal. This House must be allowed to exercise its democratic mandate on behalf of all of our constituents. Yes. We must have those indicative votes unwhipped. So let's not play the game that the House has had the opportunity. We all know how the whipping system works. Yeah. This needs to be free votes to enable us as members of Parliament, representatives of the well-being of our constituents, to have our say and stop this madness now. Yeah. 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 Mr Speaker, I agree with a great deal of what the Honourable Member said. I think possibly the most telling phrase she used there was it's time to stop playing games, because this is all a game to a lot of these people. Far too often, when we're talking about the most serious threat that these islands have faced in peacetime within recorded history. We see smirks and jokes on the yeah. front bench every time somebody yeah. in opposition benches is taken. Just I'll give you in a second. And, and I find it incredible that once he comes off his phone, when the Secretary of State took the best part of half an hour to explain why the Prime Minister was justified in going against the clear will of the House yet again from last Thursday's vote. He spent about half his time throwing eggs and tomatoes at the opposition front bench. Now, I would agree with him to an extent. I don't think the opposition's position has been at all clear. I don't think they have been an effective opposition. But it is no excuse for any government to say, we haven't caused this disaster by being in government. Somebody else caused it by not being a good enough opposition. If the government causes a disaster, the government is responsible for it. And nobody I'll give you once more and make some uh, I'm very grateful. Uh, well, and further to, to the earlier intervention there, it seems also there are rumours uh, on Twitter of the Prime Minister talking about general election. 
Surely it would be the height of a responsibility to leave the United Kingdom in the furnace of economic meltdown to run a general election without first revoking Article 50. If the Prime Minister is calling a general election, she must first write a letter to Brussels to get Article 50 revoked before she can hold any general election. Anything else is utterly responsible. There is no time. A letter must be written first. We'll get all their seats back. <laughs> well, Mr. Speaker, it may well be irresponsible, reckless, and thoroughly irrational, but that doesn't mean that this Prime Minister uh, will necessarily rule it out. Mr. Speaker, within the last three or four days, we had a very clear message from the mm. government, as they sort of very well pointed out by the Honourable Member, the Honourable Member for Box to earlier. The government clearly intended this House to believe that we were voting for a long extension if the agreement had not been uh, accepted. In fact, there are two mentions of the, the quotes from the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, not just the one that the right honourable member mentioned. We had the Prime Minister tripping herself to vote against a resolution that she had tabled and clearly, presumably supported at the point that she tabled it. We had the Secretary of State, <coughs> despite trying to say it was not what he did, commending a motion and then voting against the motion later on. We have had, as has been pointed out, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster on behalf of the Government saying that asking for a short one-off extension would be reckless a few days before the Prime Minister on behalf of the Government went off and asked for a short one-off <laughs> reckless extension. We have had the, the Brexit Minister, the Honourable Member for Spelthorne, who is in his key place just now, telling us that there have been many votes in this House against SNP amendments for revocation. There have not there haven't been any. He told us that the rules of procedure for the Joint Committee under the Withdrawal Agreement do not provide for delegations. Rule 3 of Annex 8 very explicitly refers to delegations, so the Minister was wrong again. With the same Minister yes, telling my right honourable friend that during the transition period we would still be within the European Union, clear and absolute <laughs> nonsense from the dispatch box. Mr. Speaker, it has come to the point, Mr. Speaker. But this House can no longer take at face value anything from the Government Minister speaking at that dispatch box. One of the most ancient and surely most sacred traditions of this House, that when a Minister speaks at the dispatch box, the word can be taken uh, as being correct. That no longer applies, not through any ill will, I would say, on behalf of the individual Ministers, but because far too often a Minister says something that was true today and a different Minister says something tomorrow that makes it cease to be true. This is no way to run a government. It is no way to run a parliament. Absolutely on that point. I am grateful for the honourable gentleman for giving away. I do not know whether he was in the House on, I think it was on Monday, when the Minister who sits in his place, the honourable member for Spelthorne, uh, and honourable members may recall uh, an urgent question or whatever it was, Mr Speaker, because there have been so many. But the honourable gentleman stood at the dispatch box and he said, um, it's very plain, if we are, we are given the meaningful vote, we will seek a short extension, if we get that through the House. And if we do not, mm -hmm. we will seek a longer extension. So yet another yeah. Government Minister yeah. giving a well promise, said, yeah, a commitment right. at yeah, that right. dispatch box, which, yeah. with respect, has not been worth the paper it's been printed on in Hansard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm very grateful to the member for yet another example, Mr. Speaker. It's becoming increasingly clear that when ministers come to the dispatch box to defend their government's handling of Brexit, they will say what they think needs to be said. And if it happens to coincide with the truth, that's useful. If it doesn't, <laughs> someone has to come back in the back yeah. of them and correct yeah, it. Yeah. How do we expect yeah. European negotiators to have any faith in what British government representatives are saying, when time and time and time and time and time again it's abundantly clear that we cannot take a at true face value anything that Ministers are saying from the dispatch box. A system of government and parliament, Mr Speaker, that depends entirely on being able to trust what Ministers are saying, and Ministers are simply not bothering to check the facts before they declare them in these solemn circumstances. Uh, I hope that Lord Dempsey contribute to this debate, so I, 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 I thank him for giving way. Would you agree with me that the real crisis of democracy would you not agree with me that the real crisis of democracy is not that we are asking the people again, because I can never understand why more democracy can be less democracy. The real crisis of democracy is that this government ignores democratic votes in this House. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I say that is part of the crisis of democracy. It is certainly not the only part of our democracy that is in crisis. Mr Speaker, we hear from a government that claims to want to respect the will of Parliament and the will of the people, although it has been made perfectly clear. The people are not allowed to change their minds. 
The right turn from the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster's speech to the Prime Minister's actions, both on behalf of the Government, tell us that five days is enough time to allow 100 per cent of the Cabinet to change their mind, but almost three years is not enough time to allow 3 per cent of the population of these islands to change their minds, because it only needs 3 per cent of the population to change their minds to get a different result in another referendum. The Government think there has been a significant shift in public opinion. That is why they do not want to allow the public to have another say. If they were confident that Leave would win another fair, uncheated referendum, they would not be running away from it so quickly. Year, year, year. I, I, I thank the gentleman. We have heard that there is a rumour that the Prime Minister intends to make a statement in number 10 this afternoon, or this evening possibly. Would he agree with me that it would be far more appropriate, and in fact it would be an insult to this House that it was not the case? She should come here first before making any statement. Well, Mr Speaker, I am not sure that what is appropriate and what is an insult to this House is a consideration for the Prime Minister and indeed the rest of the Government. They will do what they think will get their way through Parliament, um, whether it is upholding the traditions of this House. And I find it astonishing that I am defending the traditions of this place to a, a bench full of Conservative Party Ministers. It was never what I thought I would do when I first got elected. But we have Government who have been held formally to be in contempt of Parliament, and I believe a lot of their actions set in the last couple of weeks and what they intend to do next Monday, by all accounts, demonstrates that that contempt of Parliament has only deepened since the House had to pass that resolution, that shameful resolution against them last year. I have given away a good number of times. We really need to make some progress. Mr Speaker, when we see the First Ministers of the National Governments of Scotland and Wales being frozen out almost completely, and the leader of a non-governmental party effectively being able to pull the strings yep, on half right. the Conservative Party, <coughs> a party whose total election votes in 2017 was smaller than the population right. of Scotland's second city, not even the biggest city, the smallest city. You have to wonder where the democratic principle in that comes. And then it became quite clear last weekend that the attempts to persuade the DUP to back the deal weren't about persuading them that it was actually better than they thought. They weren't about persuading them that the backstop wasn't as big a threat to them as they thought. It was about trying to find out how much money could be dug out of the Treasury in order <coughs> to buy their support. What kind of an honourable way is that for government to work? Yeah, we know we don't, you don't agree with it. We know you think it's damaging to constituents, but they can then send some money to your way or your constituents' way so that you won't notice how damaging it is. In a lot of other contexts, Mr Speaker, that practice would have a very different word indeed, and it would not be an honourable practice at all. I will give you once more. Yeah, yeah. You, you mentioned uh, how minorities can lead the, the, the majority, but in the case of Scotland, is it not the case that a small group of six have inflicted tax rises on the people of Scotland rather than the government that is in there? Oh, well, Mr. Speaker, there's the majority does, in Parliament there are some important differences there. The reason that the Scottish Green Party were able to have some influence on the Scottish Government's business is because when they were invited to talks, they accepted that invitation. Uh, Other parties uh, with significantly say. more political clout and therefore presumably much more opportunity to influence those talks chose not to accept uh, the invitation. Uh, they went away in a huff. They preferred, they wanted to have things to complain about, and when they couldn't find anything proper to complain about, they invented some kind of bogus outrage about a tax that is actually legalised and is part of the policy of their own party within this government. Yeah, Mr yeah. Speaker, his party did not take part in discussions with the Government of Scotland because they, did, they turned down the invitation. Our party very often has not taken part in discussions with the Government of the United Kingdom because we have not even had an invitation, right. neither have any of the other yeah, parties yeah. represented here, apart from the DUP, but there again, they are not represented here. <laughs> so, Mr Speaker, the United Kingdom faces a grim choice of, of two futures, essentially, because we are now almost hours rather than days away from the time when the only option left will be revoke Article 50 or plunge off the cliff edge without a deal. We are running out of time for anything else. The Prime Minister has taken us 99 per cent of the way between the referendum and cliff edge day, and she still has no idea how she is going to avoid that cliff edge. The people of Scotland are facing a choice of two futures as well. It is becoming increasingly and alarmingly clear what our future will be if we remain tied 
to this failed and dysfunctional union of so-called equals? Do we want to be part of a union that treats elected national leaders with contempt and kowtows to the leaders of parties who in the not too distant past have invoked homophobia and bigotry as a way of garnering electoral support? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do we want to be part of a true partnership of equals where half a billion people and their governments will stand shoulder to shoulder with a government of a nation of barely three million people to make sure the three million cannot be bullied by a bigger neighbour? Or will we remain part of a union where it is made perfectly clear that even if our people have rejected a disastrous Brexit by a majority of almost two to one, we are part of the union, so that is what we have to take. Mr Speaker, I want to see a longer extension to Article 50. Because I want the people of the United Kingdom to have a chance to say we made a mistake. I don't need to hope, because I know for absolute certainty that before any of us are very much longer, the people of Scotland will be given the chance to say in 2014 we made a mistake. And this time, Mr Speaker, there can be no doubt whatsoever about what the choice the people of Scotland will be. So I look forward to seeing the people of Scotland take our place beside our Irish cousins and our Irish neighbours as full independent sovereign members of the Equal Partnership of the European Union. Thank you. Order. Justine Greening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, like many in this House, um, it is impossible to overstate the concern that I have for our country as things stand today. We are nine days away from Brexit. And as things stand, we have not got an agreed strategy for this country to follow. And instead, we have a government that is continuing to put its head in the sand about a deal that is simply not accepted by this parliament. I think there are, there'll be many books written about why we ended up in this position. But I think the, the reality is this, this situation was clear months ago. It was clear when the Chequers Agreement and then subsequent White Paper was launched that that strategy would not command a consensus in this House, and that has proved the case ever since. And I want to briefly, Mr Speaker, talk about what damage that has done to this place, and then in finishing, come back to the fact that even if the Government was to get a deal through, it will be a Pyrrhic victory that serves no one, including themselves. This government has delayed. We are having an extension debate today because the government has not been prepared to confront the fact that its deal has not been accepted by this House. The reality is, uh, in doing all of this, it has, I think, also undermined the procedures of this House, which are there to help this democracy and those of us privileged enough to be part of it, elected to represent our communities, it's actually damaged the fabric of this place, in my view. Because how Parliament is meant to work is that we come here, we represent our communities, we, and we have a vote. And then on the back of that decision, the House moves on to the consequences of that vote and what it means. But instead, when it's come to Brexit and with this deal, the government's refused to allow that to happen. So first of all, it refused to actually have the vote and wasted precious time that this country didn't have in just simply delaying because it didn't want to confront the fact that its deal, which was unpopular since the summer, uh, was still popular, unpopular by Christmas. The next thing that then happened is, of course, we did finally get the chance to have a vote. I had made my speech before Christmas, before the vote was cancelled and the debate was suddenly cut short. But the, the deal was not just narrowly defeated, it was significantly defeated. If ever there was a vote in this House that expressed the House's will, it was that one. If ever there was a time when a government clearly should have seen the writing on the wall, it was that moment. Had at that stage the government chosen to listen to what members from across the House, across parties were saying, representing their communities, not trying to be awkward, as has been given the impression by Ministers to Parliament, but simply reflecting the fact that very few people were writing to them, 
telling them that they wanted their representative to support this deal, had the government recognised that, we could have spent time, even since mid-January, debating and discussing and trying to conclude whether there was another route forward that Britain could have taken that did command a consensus in this House. And I have to say that in listening to the Deputy Secretary approach this debate, yet again it's been party politics. And this could have been a three-hour debate to test the House and see whether there was any kind of a consensus on what kind of an extension the government should have been making. But again, the approach hasn't been to do that. The approach has simply been to brush off the points that other members have made, to argue as if this is some kind of a debating chamber, not actually a House where decisions need to be taken at the 11th hour to save jobs and investment in our country. And that approach, I think, has massively undermined this place because fundamentally we take decisions by voting on motions and voting on legislation. If when we have votes they don't count, then it strikes at the fabric of how this democracy actually works. I've heard people today say, well, what about the second referendum vote? That went down very big. But that isn't the point that everybody knows we may have another vote on a second referendum. We know that we may have second, third votes on lots of things. It's because the way the government's <coughs> approached Brexit has undermined the very basis on which this House debates, which it is we have an issue and we have one vote. And if you support that motion, you support it then. You shouldn't expect it to come back to the House for another vote at a later time. Those rules are there to protect not just MPs in this House, but to make sure this democracy works. And we have fundamentally seen it undermined when it's come to Brexit. We are not meant to have vote after vote after vote, and meaningful vote three, as the Minister says. I'll give way in a second. We're not meant to have three votes on the deal because it's meant to protect MPs in this House from being bullied, from being bullied by the whips. It's meant to protect our democracy from becoming the kind of pork barrel democracy where we see billion pound funds launched purely to try and get MPs on side for the next round of voting. This isn't how the UK Parliament is meant to run. It's totally unacceptable. I'll give way to my Sanjima, uh, my right honourable friend is making a very powerful case for parliamentary sovereignty, which is, after all, what the referendum uh, was about in many ways. Does she agree with me that in trying to ram through a deal by bullying MPs to vote for it, the government is actually not building a sustainable majority, which is needed not just for this deal, but will be needed uh, for the months ahead, because so much about the Prime Minister's deal is open-ended and not settled yet? He's absolutely right, and I will come on to that very shortly uh, when, I, when I close my, my remarks. The reality is that in terms of the extension that we need, it clearly does need to be for a purpose. There are only so many versions of Brexit, frankly. Um, frankly, you can, you can do a, a clean break, hard Brexit, but I, I know and respect many MPs in this House want to see, and indeed I think for those millions of people who voted for Brexit, that was their expectations of the kind of Brexit they would have. You can have that, you can have this soft Brexit that the government's proposing, but I see very little support for uh, in this House, but also very little support reflected in the public more widely. The last opinion poll I saw on this deal showed just 12% of the public supporting it. And I just really, I, I will give way. My right honourable friend, and she will remain my friend, and I think she's a great friend, if I may say, Mr Speaker, to this House, and she speaks with great authority and great good sense. I know that in the past she's talked about shabby deals behind doors. Does it concern her to learn, as many of us are learning, Mr Speaker, on Twitter, <coughs> that the Prime Minister is meeting with leaders of parties and groups? I think that's the first time she will have met with all the party leaders, and including the independent in group, room. in one room at one time. Mm -hmm. Then she's meeting in another group. She's meeting a group of hard Brexiteers, Brexiteers presumably from the backbenchers of the Conservative Party. And then apparently, Mr Speaker, at eight o'clock, 
She is not coming to this place to make a statement to this Parliament, but she is making a press announcement of some description in Downing Street. Does, that share, does she share my concern that that has, just speaks volumes about the entirely inappropriate and shabby way that this entire process has been conducted from the outset? Greening. I agree, and I think that, in a sense, that there are really two issues here. One is the substance of the decision we need to take, which I was just talking about. The second is then the manner in which the decision is taken in a way that makes it a sustainable one. The substance is there are only so many routes forward on Brexit, frankly. This House just needs to decide whether it can find a consensus on any of them, and if we can't, we then need to confront what that therefore means in relation to finding a decision uh, for the country as a whole. I've been very clear that I felt back in July it was clear this place was gridlocked. I don't take any pleasure from the fact that actually that's been absolutely proven correct. But it has not served this country well that this government has sought to simply avoid that fact and put its head in the sand and therefore were days away from Brexit with no decisions being taken. There's no point saying that a referendum will waste time when the government itself has wasted far more time, I think, than a referendum would have ever taken. If we were having an extension debate that was of any kind of quality or meaning, frankly, we should be debating whether we want to delay to the calendar year end or a fiscal year end next year, or beyond that, we would be talking about what the rationale was for that in relation to the different strategies on Brexit that are clearly there. There are only so many. But I don't think the way that this debate has been approached, or indeed how it reflects the broader Brexit process, um, has served our democracy well, but also it's been hugely counterproductive. And I simply just want to finish my comments um, this afternoon by saying, even if the government wins a vote on its deal next week, um, and it's allowed to have one, Mr Speaker, I, I listened to your uh, ruling yesterday um, and, and felt you were right uh, to make that ruling, but even if somehow a third meaningful vote, uh, which wasn't substantially different, was allowed to be put to the House and it was won, the government has not won the argument. Brexit isn't a moment and a vote in this House. It's about a process, a journey that we will take Britain on over the coming years. And therefore, just some cobbling together of a majority at one moment, that doesn't yeah, fix yeah. anything. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't take the decision about whether those of my colleagues who quite genuinely feel that this version of Brexit isn't what 17 million people voted for, it doesn't address their concerns. Yeah, yeah. They're not going to quite rightly simply accept this version of Brexit when they feel so passionately that the thing they've campaigned for for so many years isn't being delivered. So it actually will resolve nothing. It's more betrayal. And actually, betrayal. it will end up feeling like this government has just simply tried to get something over the line for the sake of ticking a box, it when won't work. this should have been so much more than that. And it won't work and it won't be sustainable. So it doesn't just serve our democracy badly, it serves our country badly too. And I, I can predict that we'll simply have to revisit this once we've done it anyway. And I know that um, this won't be uh, welcome to ministers' ears, and actually um, they've set their face against listening to uh, contrary comments uh, to government policy for, for years, for months certainly, um, in this chamber. But I'm afraid the time has now come when they need to face facts and face reality. Because I'm afraid the one thing this House cannot do is take decisions per se for the Prime Minister and make her follow them, it seems. We need government ministers to now wake up, smell the coffee, and actually start acting responsibly on behalf of this country. This House rejects the government's deal. We want an alternative. Allow this House to have the debate that can find the alternative, and allow this House to then take a decision about what we need to do as a parliament if we can't do that as well. But what we can't do is just steadily get towards the cliff edge of the 29th of March and ignore the fact that we're in a grave crisis for this country, that it will affect people's livelihoods and jobs, and simply ignore that. Because to me, having grown up in a place where there was unemployment, I find that 
totally unacceptable. <laughs> Shameful. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, Mr Hilary Benn. Mr Speaker, thank you very much indeed. It is a genuine <coughs> privilege and a pleasure to follow the Right Honourable Member yeah. for Putney, yeah. who has just made yeah. an outstanding speech yeah. about the state that we are in. And I would just add to that, for sheer chaos, I think uh, the last 24 hours will take some beating when the annals of Brexit finally come to be written. Now, should we be entirely surprised as a House? I don't think so, because it is consistent with a pattern of behaviour that dates right back to the first days after the referendum result, because we know in this House that we have had to persuade, cajole, push the government at every single stage to listen to the views and the votes of us as members of the House of Commons. And one of the consequences of their refusal to have done so is there's a terrible lack of trust in the government, its intentions, its processes, and we need trust if we are going to make a progress, because at the moment we have absolutely no idea where we are heading. I simply want to say three things about the priorities for the House of Commons and for the country now. Priority number one is we must achieve an extension to Article 50. That is why we voted against leaving with no deal on Wednesday of last week. It's why we voted in favour of requiring the government to make an application for an extension to Article 50 on Thursday of last week. Because if we don't get it, we will leave with no deal in nine days' time. And we can move whatever statutory instruments we like in this place. We only prevent a no-deal Brexit if, on the one hand, we have changed the law in the Act that we passed last year, but on the other hand, if the EU agree agrees to grant an extension. In other words, the two have to come together at the right moment to guarantee this, that extension. And I thought we will all have listened very carefully, reading on our phones, what Donald Tusk had to say about a short extension being dependent on a positive vote on the withdrawal agreement next week. Uh, I only hope that what he didn't say about an alternative extension being available, and I hope that is in his mind, if the House decides it's not going to vote for that extension, uh, 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 not going to vote for the deal if it comes back. The second thing that we need to do, uh, I will give way, of course. I'm very, very grateful indeed for the Honourable Gentleman, right, Honourable for giving way. Um, does he agree that, in the light of what President Tusk has just said? It would be remiss of the House not to consider the deal another time next week, given that he has encouraged us very much to do so and made clear that an extension is conditional on us having considered it again. I can only presume that it is Mr Tusk uh, trying to encourage uh, Parliament and the country finally come to a decision, because, as the Honourable Gentleman will be well aware, there is great frustration on the part of the EU, because when we meet them as members of the Select Committee, uh, I remember at a recent meeting, Donald um, Michel Barnier said, uh, what we don't really need now is more time. We need some decisions. And I, I would express that frustration at the government, because the story of this sorry tale, which has brought us to our present condition, is a story of an unwillingness to take decisions, real decisions, about the future choices that we face, as the fantasies of the Leave campaign have collided harshly with the reality of the last two and three quarter years. And if the government had been willing to make those decisions, then maybe it could have been able to command a majority uh, in the House. I, I will give way to my fellow member of and valued member of the Select Committee. I, I thank him for giving way. Doesn't he find it extraordinary that the government excuses the House? for indulging in uh, not making a, its decision in Brexit, when actually the blame should be clearly at the feet of the Conservative Party opposite. Yes. Yeah. Well, I agree uh, with the Honourable Lady, and it seems to me the story of indulgence over the last two and three quarter years is an indulgence of one section of the Conservative Party that has held the Prime Minister and therefore the country to ransom, and that is why it was a bit rich of the Prime Minister today to include 
to accuse us of indulgence when she is the one who has been practising for two and a half years. Of course I will give way. I thank my right hon. Friend for giving way. Um, would he agree with me that the whole language of blame and trying to assign blame is incredibly <coughs> juvenile, given what is at stake for the country? that what we should be talking about is what is in the national interest. And as the Father of the House argued earlier on, we are at an impasse. The Prime Minister's deal has been rejected heavily twice by this House for a reason. And if we want to be able to make progress, we need to be able to discuss the alternatives in a structured and coherent way with the government's full support. That is what this House is crying for, and that is what the government should support if we are going to make progress. I agree completely with what the Honourable Gentleman says, and I'm not terribly interested in blame, but I am interested in analysing how we have come to this point. And some may regard that as a portioning of blame. I regard it as a description of what has happened. And that's why the second thing I want to say is we've got to demonstrate, as a House, that we intend to use the time, if we get it, for a purpose. Because we're not going to sit here for, whether it's three months or longer, twiddling our thumbs because the public expects us to try and find a way forward that we can agree on. And the Prime Minister's strictures, she has a perfectly fair point. We know what we're against. What are we for? And that should purpose should be to consider uh, and then vote on a number of different ways forward. And I am an advocate of indicative votes. And they're called indicative for a really important reason. I think a sensible place to start is to say to members, look, you can move in the direction of a free trade agreement, and there are members in the House who would argue for that. You can decide that you want a customs union. You can argue that you want Norway and a customs union or a customs arrangement. Which of those three would you like us to explore further? Because it enables members, in my case, I'd vote for two of those. I wouldn't vote for the free trade agreement for the reasons the Prime Minister has set out as to why it wouldn't work for Northern Ireland or indeed for friction free trade, but I'd vote for the other two when we get to that moment because it then gives us an indication of where support might lie in the House of Commons. And I, would, uh, I will I would just point out that Monday is our opportunity in the motion that the um, the um, Secretary of State clarified when he said he was talking about the motion in neutral terms. Monday will be our opportunity to start that process, and the House must take it. Of course, I will give way to my honourable friend. Very grateful to my honourable <coughs> friend, who once again is making an outstanding speech on this, uh, on this issue. Would he be able to uh, <coughs> surmise what may happen next week if the government bring uh, the statement on Monday? do not bring meaningful vote three until perhaps Tuesday or Wednesday, and we're left in a situation whereby uh, President Tusk has already said that an extension would only be given to the 30th of June if the deal was passed, and we still have to change primary legislation in this place with the draw act, the date of the draw act by Friday. What he thinks the government are trying to do, I suspect the Prime Minister is trying to bounce us and bribe us into backing her deal. Yeah. Well, I, I think, it, well, not quite in fairness to the Prime Minister, her purpose and her method has been obvious for a very, very long time. It it's my deal or yeah. no deal yeah. to perhaps this, <coughs> us on this side of the House, and in recent months, a variation, my deal, no deal, delay, no Brexit, to others that she hopes to persuade to come on board uh, her proposal. That is what she's seeking to do. Now, ultimately, it falls to us, as members of the House of Commons, to determine what happens. And courtesy of the really important Whiteman judgment, if the worst came to the worst on Friday, uh, then revocation is the one other option that we have, because that does not require the approval of the 27 yeah. member states. I hope we, really hope we don't get to the point, because I cannot see how it can be in the interests of the European Union in the end to force us out with no deal, because they will get all of the blame uh, for all of the consequences that would flow from that. And the final point I want to make, Mr Speaker, is I really would urge the government, after we've been through the process that I described in answering the member who intervened a moment ago, to listen to what Parliament says. Because it's no good inviting us to indicate what we're for 
if the House, when it does indicate it, what it might be for, the Government says, I'm not prepared <coughs> to go in that direction, yeah. I'm not prepared to change. If we are going to move, the Government is going to have to move along with everybody else. And two and three quarter years have showed the Government has been unwilling to move one inch. So that the Government comes back with a plan, a revised plan, because it is the Government's responsibility. We don't want to seize control of the process for the sake of it, but if the Government isn't acting, then Parliament is going to have to act in its stead. For the Government to bring a plan back, having listened to what the House has said, so we can debate it, amend it and vote on it. I'll give way for the final time. Giving way. Did he share the frustration, I think, of many of us when, in fact, more honourable members voted against no deal, the original Spellman Amendment, which he'll, be, he'll remember, than actually voted for the Brady Amendment? And yet the government, the Prime Minister, completely ignored the vote that we'd had that rejected no deal and, and to put it in crude terms, kept banging on about the benefits of Brady. Well, I, the Honourable Lady makes a very uh, powerful point. There is a certain selectiveness in the uh, government's reflection on the decisions that we have made. And I, I simply would say this. I think the public expects us to get on and do our job. And if we can agree a deal, or if we remain deadlocked, then I have to say I look forward to the moment when we get the chance to vote in favour of the proposal for a confirmatory referendum proposed by my honourable friends, yeah, the members for Sedgefield yeah, yeah. and for Hove, so the British people can make the final decision. Because I just conclude on this point, Mr Speaker. If it is democratic, and the government argues it from the front bench, to come back not once, but twice, and who knows, maybe three times, yeah. to ask us to change our minds yeah. on the government's deal, why is it undemocratic to ask the British people whether they, on yeah. reflection, would like to change yeah. theirs? Mr Dominic Bree. Well, th th thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, Mr Speaker, I've, be I've been in this House for long enough, I think nearly 22 years, to know that governments face great difficulties and often have to adjust to circumstances. So one should get used to the fact that occasionally governments say things in this House which they intend to do and then subsequently uh, they are unable uh, to do them. But I have to say the process of Brexit has brought me face to face with the fact that the underlying integrity which one hopes one will continue to see from government, even in difficult circumstances, now seems to be fast running out. And that troubles me very much because I've been a member of the Conservative Party for uh, over 40 years. Um, I find myself in a state of amity with my colleagues, even though Brexit has introduced a revolutionary upheaval into our affairs, uh, which uh, means that we have divergent views on a specific issue, which is causing us, as a party, great difficulty. But notwithstanding that, we have, and the government who we are being asked to support has, to try and maintain some sustained integrity through that process. What therefore am I to make of a situation where only a few days ago, in order to avoid something that the government didn't want, which was the possibility of this House taking control of the order paper to debate alternatives outside of the control of the government. Ministers of the Crown, standing at the dispatch box, give a series of plain assurances to the House of what the government intends to do if its deal cannot go through, in terms of how it's going to approach the negotiations with the European Union thereafter, and the sort of length of extension it is going to seek. That is what happened, and subsequently, today, this has, these assurances have been entirely reneged upon. And, and most extraordinary of all, one might have expected the uh, Right Honourable Gentleman, who is no longer in his place, the Secretary of State for uh, the Department for Exiting the European Union, to come along and provide some coherent explanation for why this had happened. 
But he didn't. Indeed, the only explanation he half advanced was a total irrelevance. It was the suggestion that this was due, Mr Speaker, to your ruling that the motion couldn't be brought forward a third time, which is of course a nonsense, because the government knows itself very well that had it wished today, it could have brought forward a motion to disapply our conventions, and had we wished to do so, to move on to a meaningful vote on its motion had it wished. And it is beyond comprehension and beyond rational analysis how a Minister of the Crown standing at this dispatch box this afternoon can say that that is a justification for having changed the position and decided that the extension is going to be extremely short. When, as I say, my right honourable uh, friend, the member for Aylesbury, had described such a short extension on behalf of the government as being reckless. Now, of course, this is part of a wider pattern of the complete disintegration of collective responsibility in government. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have ministers coming to the dispatch box and saying entirely contradictory things. We have ministers publicly disassociating themselves from government policy and staying in post. We have ministers who come up to one in the corridors and acknowledge that the situation is very serious and they disagree with what the government is doing, continuing to serve in a cabinet with which they apparently fundamentally yeah. Yeah. disagree. Yeah. 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 When my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, came to the dispatch box today at Prime Minister's questions, I confess I think it was the worst moment I have experienced since I came into the House of Commons. I have never felt more ashamed yep. to be a member of the Conservative Party or to be asked to lend her support. Yep. She spent most of her time castigating the House yep. for its misconduct. Yep. At no stage did she pause to consider whether it is in fact the way she is leading this government which might be contributing to this situation. I have great sympathy for her. I've known her for many years and we had a personal friendship beyond and outside of this house. But I have to say, I could have wept. Wept to see her reduced to these straits and wept to see the extent to which she was now simply zigzagging all over the place rather than standing up for what the national interest must be. Now we're told that uh, there's going to be a short extension. We're told that next week we will have an opportunity perhaps for a meaningful vote, which I very much think is going to lead to uh, the, the vote being, the government's deal being rejected. Because for a whole variety of reasons, members of this House feel very strongly that it's bad for our country for differing reasons. But if I may say to my honourable friends on the front bench, that view can't simply be cast to one side, whether it comes from Honourable members and friends with whom I disagree or those with whom I agree on this issue for Brexit. It can't just be lightly dismissed. It comes from their own analysis of what they think the national interest to be. And of course, that's a huge challenge for the Prime Minister, for which I have immense sympathy for her. But you don't meet that challenge by ducking and diving and avoiding and having a galaxy of ministers appear at the dispatch box and say contradictory things. You've got to face up to your responsibility. Yeah. And rather than coming along and showing contempt for this House, yes. actually trying to engage with it and making use of what this House can do yeah. pretty well, which is debate issues in a rational way, and which in itself, by a process of debate, might lead to a reasonable outcome. And I've come in for quite a lot of flack over the last two years because of my various amendments. But most of my amendments, Mr Speaker, have been designed not to achieve a specific end, but to try to facilitate process. And each time I've put them up, the government has tried to prevent them. So my view is bound to be coloured of the government, which seeks to close down debate in this irrational fashion. And next week we are going to face the same challenge again, but in a very concertina time frame. We are in danger of crashing out with no deal. If the rumours are right, we are coming very close to the point where the EU, perfectly reasonably in my judgement, may well be saying we've had enough. 
And indeed, if I read the statement that's recently come out, I think that that's probably what they're saying. What are we going to do next week? What's my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, going to do next week? Are we going to extend across the House and try to reach some level of consensus and a way forward? Are we going to try to bring this sorry saga to an end uh, by, for example, going back to the public, as was suggested by uh, Right Honourable Gentleman, just as he spoke previously, as a possibility, and putting the options to them and asking them, which I would be perfectly prepared to do, and to support my Right Honourable Friend, the Prime Minister, in doing, if that would help. Are we prepared to look at alternatives when it would seem so apparent that the deal itself is going to be rejected? Just browbeating this House yeah. is going to serve no purpose yeah, at all. Yeah. It brings us undoubtedly into contempt, but the contempt falls much more on the government that is doing this than on members who are voicing their individual views and doing the best they can to represent their constituents' yeah. interests. That's the challenge we now face, and we may face a very short time frame for doing it, something which on the whole I rather hoped we might avoid. Not perfect in itself, but that was the purpose of a longer extension, to enable this process to happen, which has been shut down over past weeks and months. We may now have to do it very quickly, but I have to say this in conclusion. If we do not do it, one has to ask the, oneself the question, what is the purpose of this government? What is it doing? How is it furthering the national interest? How is it contributing to the quiet good governance, which I think most people in this country want? We really are, I'm sorry to say this, at the 11th hour and 59th minute. The government's credibility is running out. Trust in it is running out. And unless my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, by some great exertion of will, and she has plenty of will and plenty of robustness, stands up and starts doing something different, we are going to spiral down into oblivion. And the worst part of it all is that we will deserve it. Uh, yes, I'll take a point of order uh, briefly. Point of order, Mr Ian Murray. Very grateful, uh, Mr Speaker, and I will be very brief. It's been confirmed in the last few moments that the Prime Minister is to make a statement in Downing Street at 8pm this evening. And given this debate can run until just after 20 past six, and there's two other items on the order paper that could take up to three hours beyond the point of interruption, is there any mechanism that this House has to get the Prime Minister to make that statement okay. to this House rather than to the public via the media in Downing Street? Well, I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for his point of order, of which I did not have advance notice and about which fact I don't complain. I'm simply signalling that my response is a spontaneous response to what the Honourable Gentleman has put to me. It would certainly be my expectation, if this debate runs its full length, that the House will be sitting at the time of the announced Prime Ministerial statement. It would certainly be open to the Prime Minister to come to the House to make the statement here. It is a matter for her to judge whether she wishes to do so. My sense is that that would be well received by the Honourable Gentleman and quite possibly in the light of what has been said by other people. It isn't for the Chair to seek to compel or instruct any Minister, including most certainly the Prime Minister, but I have noted what he said and insofar as he's asking, can it happen? The answer is, yes, it can. I would like to suggest an advisory and voluntary time limit on backbench speeches of six minutes or thereabouts, but I am not at this stage, particularly as I haven't given notice, imposing a, a formal limit. Let's see how we go, but it would be helpful in the name of maximising participation if people didn't speak for too long. But I will leave it to the wise judgment of the Honourable Member for Wirral South. Alison McGovern. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I have no intention for detaining the House any longer than necessary, so I take your advice on that, particularly as this debate has possibly been the most frustrating debate I have ever sat through in 
nine years in this House, Mr Speaker. I find myself very angry this afternoon, um, which is not to say that it's not an honour and a pleasure to follow the member for Beaconsfield. Some people, Mr Speaker, in this House say that the lawyers here don't make very good politicians. <coughs> I think that the member for Beaconsfield just proved them wrong. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's an excellent speech. I agree with so much of uh, what he said and his analysis of what the Prime Minister has tried to do to this House. But in that, Mr Speaker, I just want to start on a reflection on a sign that I walked past one of the protesters outside this place holding. Uh, last week, Mr Speaker, he was holding a sign that said Parliament versus the people. And Mr Speaker, isn't that the message that we heard earlier from the dispatch box? Isn't that what was said? Aren't we being told that we are frustrating the will of the British people, Mr Speaker? Well, I say that way populism lies. If we undermine the ability of members of this House to deliberate, to listen to each other, to form a view, to vote, to decide, to take, deci to take decisions. I think we open the door to the kind of behaviour that we are seeing right across the developed world at the moment. And it is dangerous, Mr Speaker. We can believe in democracy and letting people have their say, at the same time as recognising that this House is entitled to express its view, and when it does so, it should be listened to by the executive. And I'll come to that uh, more later. Today's debate has arisen, though, out of frustration because of events overnight, which have been absolutely astounding. The government have decided, as they had to do because the House has not supported their proposal for how to deal with Britain's exiting of the European Union, the Government has decided that as we face the deadline that they set for us on Brexit, that now is the time to delay exit day. And we heard from other members that we have uh, received a copy of the Prime Minister's letter to President Tusk during the proceedings of this House. So we find out what's happening from the media and then we see a copy of the letter during proceedings of this House. I will give way. I'm grateful to her for giving way. She will recall that I put that point to the Secretary of State earlier and he told us that the Prime Minister had put a copy of, a, a copy of the letter in the library at 10 past 12. But I've made inquiry and it appears that the letter wasn't published online until 1.30pm by the library. So does she agree with me that it's cynical in the extreme to put a copy of the letter in the library when we're all in here for PMQs and not to actually publish it online where we could look at it until PMQs are over and the Prime Minister has left the House? Th thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the uh, Honourable Lady for her intervention. Um, I don't say this very often, Mr Speaker, but thank goodness for Twitter. Because as, when, the, um, when we were told that the copy of the letter would be in the library, my very able assistant, Holly Higgins, ran across to the library to see if she could get a copy. Meanwhile, I observed uh, on Twitter that journalists had it already. And so, Thankfully, we were able to see it nonetheless, but it's cynical, Mr Speaker. It is totally cynical, as the uh, Honourable Lady points out. And it's cynical behaviour because, as other members have said very clearly, the government is trying to bully us. They are trying to exert their will and force us <coughs> to vote for their proposal. And we know this because of what the letter said. The Prime Minister says that she intends to put forward a motion as soon as possible under the Withdrawal Act and make the argument for an orderly withdrawal and a strong future partnership. And she says that if the motion is passed, that she is confident that Parliament will proceed to ratify the deal constructively. But other members have already said at length how convincing the vote against the Prime Minister's proposal has been. 
We know that this House does not want that proposal. And following the uh, amendments and uh, statements put forward by other members of this House, we know that the House of Commons has voted <laughs> conclusively no to no deal. So we don't want the government's deal and we don't want no deal, and the government accept that. So therefore, by definition, the government has to change course. It needs to come to this House with a different proposal. And that's also necessary for the government's own stated objective of having a delay, because we know that the European Union do not wish to agree to a delay for no apparent purpose. They want to see a change of course. It is, Mr Speaker, that simple. Now, I hear what other members have said about proposals um, to allow this House to express its view in some way, and no doubt that we will do that, because Lord knows, Mr Speaker, if we've demonstrated anything over the past two years, it's that this House is, possi is capable of passing amendments, if it wishes to. And we will express our view, but we are the legislature, Mr Speaker, not the executive, and therefore, by simple definition, it is the case that we do not have executive power. So we need the government to commit to changing course. We need them to bring forward proposals of how a different path will be taken. Because something else is true, Mr Speaker, and that is that the executive is not the legislature. They cannot tell us what to do. They cannot force our hand simply by fiat. We have to hear from the government what their proposals are and then we have to vote on them, either to accept or to refuse. And in the end, we can make the policies for process and discussion and deliberation as complex as we like, but Mr Speaker, it is as simple as that. We now need a change of course from the government that we can deliberate on, that we can vote on and that we can decide on. We all have a responsibility here to make our political system function as it should. Because if we don't, Mr Speaker, then it's not just the government that are complicit in opening the door to populism, it's all of us. And I don't say those words lightly. We all know the consequences of getting this wrong. So I simply beg the government to have no more bullying of this House, no more trying to bash us into voting for a deal that we've already voted down absolutely, conclusively and convincingly. Let's have no more of that. Let's have a change of course and a policy that we can support. Because my frustration, Mr Speaker, this afternoon and having this debate that's been dominated by reams and reams of words on process that is not about the central issue about if or how we leave the European Union. My frustration, Mr Speaker, is as nothing to the decisions that are having to be made now, as the Secretary of State knows well, because he's in charge of the no-deal preparations. Our frustration is nothing in comparison to the frustration of individuals, of businesses up and down this country having to take decisions that they don't want to take because the government is simply unable to plot a course to help our country move on. And I say, Mr Speaker, in conclusion, <coughs> that people in our country want us to focus on the things that really frustrate them, that really bother them, be it the desperate growth of food banks or the need for all young people in this country to have a proper chance in life. That is what they want us to focus on. So please, Mr Speaker, I ask the government, change course, make a proposal, let's vote and then let's move on. Thank you. Mr Owen Patterson. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I will be brief, as I sat and listened carefully, but I had no intention of speaking at the beginning of it. I'd very much like to follow the lady from Wirral South. Um, she touched on several points, which I entirely agree with. I come to a totally different conclusion. Just very quickly, Mr Speaker, I think there are three international events that are important. First of all, you have uh, President Tusk's statement that we need to, to uh, vote on the withdrawal agreement again. But given your stricture, which I totally support, we cannot 
vote on the same text twice, does that actually count as changed circumstances? I'm very interested in your thoughts on that, which you might like to consider as a point of order later. Uh, secondly, we've had a report, the only press report, it was put out at 1306 on the Le Point magazine website, that President Macron has stated that unless, that I think the words, words were translate, were a, a clear project, uh, France intends to uh, veto any changes. And then there have been interesting uh, reports from a respected BBC journalist that this letter from the Prime Minister has gone out so late it's too late for some Prime Ministers to consult their legislatures and they may not even have a chance to have a discussion and a, and a decision uh, this week, which is yet another muddle in this saga. Uh, Mr Speaker, the, the point I would like to make, and pick up the comments of the lady from Wirral South, talking about populism, and I've said this goodness knows how many times, in the chamber and outside, the conundrum we face is that this House had three democratic mandates around the referendum. David Cameron said, if you vote Conservative in 2015, I will give you an in-out referendum. It will be decisive. It won't be advisory, it will be decisive. Uh, uh, Can I just make this very important point? This? And, and the, the House of Commons, if I lead the majority, will deliver what the people want. We then had he, he, to his hot, I, the time's really short. If I'd like to press on, other people want to speak. We then, um, to his horror probably, he won, the, won, the, won the, <laughs> the election and had to deliver the referendum. During the processes of the referendum, it was made absolutely clear by the then Foreign Secretary that through the period of the referendum bill going through, that these decisions were being handed by sovereign MPs, were handing back their sovereignty to the people, and that the House would honour what they decided, whatever it was. And it was, a, it was not advisory, it was a decisive referendum. We then have the referendum results, biggest vote in British history, 17.4 million people voting for the broad slogan of take back control. Questions immediately, what does it actually mean? And the Conservative Party interpreted it to mean leave, and we will honour leave if you vote in the next election, 2017, we will honour that if you leave the single market, leave the customs union and leave the remit of the European Court of Justice. And that was broadly supported by the Labour Party, which means that 85% of the votes went to the two main parties who supported that proposition. And that is over 60% of the seats in this Parliament represented that proposal. And where I pick up the comments from the lady from Wirral South, I am genuinely worried this was a huge step by the British people. It was the first time, following a succession of referendums, they'd gone against the wishes of the establishment. The political establishment, the commercial establishment, the media establishment. We, we've, we've had, no, we'd had the 1975 referendum, the Scottish, Welsh, Northern Ireland referendums, we had the AV referendum, and each time the people had gone along with what the establishment wanted. What we are now wrestling with this afternoon, and the Honourable Lady raises this question of populism, we are really wrestling with how we deliver this. And my contention, Mr Speaker, and I really mean it, is that I am seriously worried about the long-term damage to the integrity of our institutions. <laughs> people, people are writing to me, sending emails. I've been mocked <laughs> for making a comment. A guy came up to me on the tube and gave me his visiting card. I think many of the for um, Sheffield Healy has picked me up on this. And she can come to my office so I can give her the visiting card of this guy if she wants to see it, saying, please stick to your guns because we depend on you to see it delivered. And I do appeal to both members of the both main parties, Liberal Democrat positions, totally honourable, SNP general. They've been consistently against this and voted against it and have gone, of course, crushed in the general election as a result. But the two main parties did really well in the general election. Uh, the Prime Minister got the second largest number of votes in history. No, time, time is really short. I'm, going to be, I'm just going to finish now. Uh, the two main parties need to think about this. If there is any sort of extension going beyond next week, that is disastrous for candidates in the Conservative cause. I think it's disastrous for candidates in the Labour cause. The first 100 seats the Labour Party has to win are 78 for Leave, 73 strongly for Leave. So I do think this is an issue where the integrity of the idea of voting is absolutely at stake. And given that the Labour Party is not going to vote with the withdrawal bill, people like me are not going to vote for it, handing over power to make law to 27 countries who are not involved, 
a position where there is no manner in which a sovereign independent UK could leave, a proposal that breaks up the United Kingdom and creates something appalling called UKNI is not acceptable to me. Therefore, we are looking, Mr Speaker, the only solution is to leave with no deal, which is the law of the land. And as Monsieur Barnier said in his statement last night, the vote has not changed that. And to keep trust with the people, I think oral members opposite, and I know this is not a popular view, looking around the chamber, those who are present today, talk about crashing out bluntly is lazy. Ask why. I've been to Dover twice in the last three weeks. We've had discussions with those in Calais, Monsieur Puisseau. They've all said they are prepared. The oral member for Daventry, answering the UQ, I thought gave some very confident answers that there have been numerous SIs, many of which I've sat on, have gone through. We have Monsieur Barnier saying that there are only two more issues, one of which is the budget, which is really not going to touch on Brexit, have only got to be sorted. So I do appeal to members to think hiding behind the mantra of crashing out is lazy. There may be hiccups, the millennium bug, there was a lot of preparation, we had exactly the same the millennium bug. Virtually every business was prepared, they just thought other businesses had not prepared, and I think that may well be the case on this occasion. But the damage from a bit of disruption is far less than the huge damage and the risk of populism should we, do, should we thwart the wishes of the 17.4 million people. Order. I was reluctant to impose a formal time limit, hoping that we could get by without it, but I'm afraid it is necessary because I want to maximise participation. Five minute limit with immediate effect of which the Honourable Lady has been notified and with which she concurred. Ms Kendall. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, several several Honourable Members have rightly said that the Prime Minister's letter requesting an extension to Article 50 wasn't what this House was promised or, or what this House agreed, but I want to make a slightly different argument, which is that a short extension will not solve the huge problems that we face in dealing with Brexit. Now, it's clear that the Prime Minister has refused to change course. She simply wants to run down the clock and blackmail MPs in supporting, uh, into supporting her withdrawal agreement. If we have another vote on the agreement next week and she loses again, even if the EU agreed to an extension, it wouldn't solve our problems because we would simply be back here in two or three months' time. Absolutely. A cliff edge would have been replaced with a brick wall yeah. and no deal would be back on the agenda. So that won't work. Will my honourable friend give way very, very, uh, very quickly? I will indeed. Yeah, I'm just conscious. No, though, James. Sorry, I'm just conscious, those of us who are here at Prime Minister's questions, is how thoroughly disrespectful she was of every member in this House today. She is just being stubborn. And as she carries on with her vanity project, it is our country that's going to go down. We are very, very concerned. Yeah. Uh, I completely agree with my, um, my honourable friend, and I'll come back to uh, the uh, Prime Minister's way of dealing with Parliament at the end of, of my, my comments. But even if the Prime Minister were to succeed in getting her withdrawal agreement through next week, Brexit will not be sorted because the withdrawal agreement does not solve any of the fundamental choices we face about our future relationship <coughs> with the EU. Uh, we will be leaving without knowing where we are going, and that means we will simply be back here time and time again at the end of the transition period, and when that is inevitably extended to, we will be back grappling with the same problems. Well, the reality I is, um, it, I, I probably won't just because I really want to try and let other people come in, I'm so sorry. Extension mm -hmm. has got to be for a purpose, and that is about facing up to the choices Brexit inevitably brings. Either we remain as close to the EU as possible to protect jobs, prevent a hard border in Northern Ireland, but give up our say over the rules, or we cut all ties with all the risks and uncertainty that brings. We have never been straight with the British public about those choices, but doing that will require time. It will take time for this House to agree which option, if it can, we should look at. It will take time to negotiate any other alternative with the EU, whether that's a customs union, common market or whatever. 
My own view is that it isn't simply about what this House decides about our future relationship. It must be about what the public thinks too. That is the only way to get a sustainable solution. Now, one of the reasons why uh, many people are concerned about a longer extension is they're worried about us having to take part uh, in the elections to the European Parliament. But I don't think this is a foregone conclusion with a longer extension. Absolutely. Eleanor Sharpston, Advocate General of the Court of uh, Justice of the European Union, has said, and I quote, that is an oversimplified and ultimately fallacious presentation of the situation. She says that just as the rules changed for accession com countries coming into the EU, uh, with changes around Article 49, so too those rules could be changed under Article 50 for the UK. For example, extending the mandates of UK MEPs who've already been democratically elected to remain in, in place for months to come. So it is not a foregone conclusion, it's about the political will to find a way forward. But just as I believe the Prime Minister should change course, I think the EU does too. They have in insisted that we cannot discuss our future relationship until we've agreed the withdrawal agreement on money, EU citizens and the border in Northern Ireland. But the truth is we cannot solve the issue of the border in Northern Ireland unless we know where we are going long term. It is the very failure of us to agree how close we remain with the EU that has inevitably leaded and led to the requirement of a backstop. So they have to change course if we're going to solve this. Just to conclude, um, Mr Speaker, and I really want to echo the points made by my uh, honourable uh, friend, the member for w uh, Wirral South. Let me make a warning to the Prime Minister and others about pitting this Parliament against the public, criticising, castigating us for not uh, bending to the will of the people as if there was one single will of the people that was clear and always remained the same. We are representatives, not delegates. We are here to exercise our judgment. It is our job to question, to scrutinise and to stand up for what we believe in. It is dangerous to try and pit this parliament against the people and not to defend our parliamentary democracy. That is a long-term challenge that the Prime Minister has simply failed to live up to, amongst many other issues. James P. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. It's an honour to uh, follow the Right Honourable Lady opposite. Um, I share so much of the frustration that has been um, espoused on both sides of the House. Uh, the reality is, is that I think we're all frustrated by the lack of progress that we've made. We're all frustrated that we are sat here having another emergency debate about Brexit because we haven't got exactly the right outcome that we would have all wanted. We're frustrated that the arguments aren't advancing. We're frustrated that in the national press this place is increasingly being portrayed with real vehemence. We're frustrated that the government isn't saying exactly what we want when we want them to say it. Um, I share all of that. I, you know, on my Twitter feed today alone, I've been called a traitor uh, by Brexiteers, and I've been called an absolute idiot and a failure by Remainers. That's our world right now, and we all want to get out of it. Of course we do. Um, and I understand the accountability that I have to my electorate back in Somerset. I understand that the decisions I take here will be judged when the next general election comes. I understand that it's my responsibility to weigh up all of the options that are presented to us in this place and to work out how they reconcile against the interests of my constituency, the things that the government, my party, are advising that they would like us to do, the manifesto on which I stood, the way that my constituency voted, the way the country. I understand all of those things. I'm constantly triangulating to do what I believe to be the right thing. Now, Mr Speaker, it strikes me that what I think is the right thing changes all the time because the circumstances are changing all the time. Our decision-making process in Brexit is iterative. Being asked the same question again and again and again is not a problem, providing that it's in a context where you might be inclined to make a different decision. And the evidence so far is that people have. Now, I would say exactly the same, by the way, about the questions that have already been put in this place about no deal, 
The questions that are already being put in this place about a second referendum, the questions that are already being put in this place about a customs union, all of those things, the Library have been digging out the detail for me this afternoon, have already been put and have already been decided upon. But it's not a problem that we should want to consider those options anew if next week we decide against the deal. I really hope that we don't, Mr Speaker. I continue to believe that it is the pragmatic and sensible way forward. But nobody in this House can say, surely, that as circumstances change around us, and they have changed significantly this afternoon in the statement by President Tusk, that a short delay is only an option if the House of Commons has decided in favour of the withdrawal agreement. That is a seismic change in circumstance that warrants a meaningful vote next week on the deal again. But nobody can say that we should consider a second referendum again or a customs union again or any of the other things on which we have already voted and then somehow say that we should not extend that same right to the deal. Mr Speaker, the one thing that this House is united on, I expect you included, having seen the clip of you being followed across the road by a journalist the other day, is that we are all very, very bored indeed of being asked the same questions and, the, and, and being on the receiving end of a very, very frustrated British public. Next week, we've got the opportunity to make a decision at last. I hope that the House has the opportunity to vote for it. I hope that we vote for it. But, Mr Speaker, surely we've reached the end of the road here. Next week, we must finally decide what it is we are in favour of, and then we should accept a short delay whilst the deal is enacted. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I'll try and keep my comments short because I know many others want to speak and I've spoken a lot in the last couple of weeks, but it is, as we all know, it feels like Groundhog Days. But I think, Mr Speaker, we have had the privilege this afternoon of hearing some quite outstanding speeches, and it's the content in particular of some of those speeches which really should concern the government front benches and, indeed, those who sit behind them. The comments of the Right Honourable Member for Putney, for example, and my Right Honourable and learned friend, the Member for Beaconsfield, when he did not hold back in describing his view as a long-serving Conservative member of this House, the sheer despair at the situation that we are in, and it has to be said, Mr Speaker, a situation that is of this government's own creation, and in particular, of the creation of the Prime Minister. And it doesn't give anybody any pleasure to say that. And I listened, obviously, as I always do, with great care to the wise words of the Honourable Gentleman for Leeds East, who I think, again, always speaks with dignity, with wisdom, with experience, and, is, and in a pragmatic and sensible way, often to try to provide the very leadership that has been so desperately lacking in the last three years. When he said, well, I, he said he doesn't like to engage in a blame game, and I agree with him on that. However, it is absolutely critical, as other honourable members have said, like the right honourable lady, for example, for Wirral South, and indeed the honourable lady for Leicester East. When, when we are looking at the situation, West indeed, uh, East West, it's always very good in Leicester, not as good as in Nottingham, but that's me. Anyway, but in all seriousness, the point is they made very important points, as ever, about how this government is interpreting events and, quite wrongly, trying to set this place up as if it's in opposition to this thing called the will of the people. And it couldn't be further from the truth. There are many honourable and right honourable members who from the very outset have spoken without fear or without favour on behalf of their constituents, doing the job that we are here to do, which is to represent all our constituents, not just to pander to the members of our political parties. And Mr Speaker, what a shameful moment it was. I'd like to think it was an inaccurate um, tweet representation from a member of the government benches, a member of parliament, who spoke to a fellow Conservative MP and said, why did you vote in the way you did? To get the reply, well, it's my association annual general meeting this week. I mean, that is the simple reality of the truth of the situation we are in. And it is a fact, Mr Speaker, and I have said it and others have said it before. We know of people 
primarily sitting over there, who regularly vote not in accordance with their conscience, not in accordance with what they believe is in the interests of their constituents, but because they are fearful either of being attacked or assaulted, and Mr Speaker, as you know, that is a very real threat to many, or they are frightened of being deselected by their Conservative associations. And that, Mr Speaker, is a fact. And that goes to the very root of democracy, and it also goes, I believe, to much of what has happened over the last three years. The inability for people to speak with honesty and to do the right thing by their constituents. And there is a sense of despair in the country that is then reflected in this place. And I won't say who it was, but there was a, an honourable member who sits over in this part of the chair, not this part, but along these benches, who said to me this morning, and they know who they are, at about <coughs> half eight, nine o'clock, they said, for goodness sakes, will she, the Prime Minister, will she just not now listen and reach out and try to form some sort of compromise and way forward? And I had to say, I am afraid to say, based on my experience, this Prime Minister will not listen to anybody that doesn't agree with her. And when she does listen, and when she does change her mind, it is only to those on the hard Brexit right of the Conservative Party. Because what all of us should seek to do is to put our country first. And as the Honourable Member for Beaconsfield said, and it must have been heavy and difficult for him to say it, but I'm afraid to say that this Prime Minister, time and time again, when she should be putting her country first, is it putting her party first? And that can't be right. Kevin Foster. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. It's a pleasure to be called in this debate, although, again, a sort of a sense of deja vu that here we are again discussing this particular issue, and it is the most important issue facing us, but I did not get elected to this House, particularly sort of election, as Torbay's MP, to just spend my time just talking about one issue. But I think there is a real sense that next week has to be different, and many people probably might be thinking that Monday, when we have, a, if we have another vote, then will be the same as we've had before, where everyone can vote against what they don't like, put up various ideas, some, some realistic, some not, and you know that the whips offices will ring over the weekend and Trump as well. I see two of my favourite whips in the chamber at the moment, the member for Scunthorpe and the member for Bury St Edmunds, and it will all be like we've had before, that we'll have a ring round, we'll come back on Monday and we'll all stand on our pedestal and vote for various options and agree none. The reality is the comments from Donald Tusk today make very clear what options there actually are. And just kicking the can, just for a fair extent, isn't a solution itself. It's a delay, not a decision. It's what we actually want it for. Which of those options we're actually looking to implement? And for me, there remain three now that we can clearly choose. The first is not one I agree with, one I think the referendum itself has ruled out, but I accept is what some members, Scottish National Party, the Liberal Democrats, probably the independent group would go for, which is the revocation of Article 50. I don't think that would be the right thing to do. I don't think it would be appropriate. I think it would be but at least those people have that is a coherent choice you can make. The second, and I listened with interest to the speech from the Runnable member for North Shropshire, would be that we left chose to leave without a deal, either next Friday or at the end of another extension. Although I think it's becoming clear that the EU's view on us just wanting to carry on debating is un not understandably, like most of the public's coming, patience is coming to an end. I don't, th I don't think it would be the disaster some make out, but I think the votes last week show the likelihood of this House agreeing that outcome. So that then brings us back to the final unilateral option that we can choose, the one that is there that we can choose, which is to vote with the proposed withdrawal agreement. And we have to be clear, this isn't the end of the process, and many people who talk about various different options, from Canada to Norway to any other idea someone wants to come up with, you almost think that whether, you know, every one of us could put our name to a new Brexit idea for all the ones that have been brought out over the last year. But it is the one that's actually there that we can agree and take forward, knowing that the European Union will agree to it and knowing that we can convert it into our own law. I'm not going to say it's perfect. I'm not going to say it's the best thing I've ever read. But then again, it never was going to be. There are clearly challenging issues. We are unravelling a 45-year 
relationship with many other economies. Some of the things that are part of it are things that are actually things that we would have probably ended up doing anyway as a sovereign state, but are things that have become wrapped up as part of our membership of the European Union. And I think there are those realistic and fairly stark choices that now face members as we consider what will happen and what we do next week. Because just saying, I want no to no deal is nonsense. You actually have to agree a solution. One of those three things are the things, or the two of the alternatives, are things you actually have to agree. It's a soundbite. It isn't a solution. And similarly, just holding out in the hope you might get no deal when it's pretty obvious where the votes will go on that. I must say, I voted last week against extension. I'm happy to have done that. I thought it was the right thing to do. But it's still, I can see that if we had that vote again next week, it's fairly predictable the way it will go. So for me, it is about now, for members, we do have a real and fundamental change with what's been said by the President of the European Council. It is about accepting that this idea that there's all wonderful types of deals that we can do isn't there. There are three simple choices available next week. And therefore, people do, and members do need to think carefully of which one of those they will wish to take, or conversely, wish to risk. If people want to revoke Article 50, that is a principal position. It's not a position I'll be voting for. No deal, we could manage it, but it's not something I see getting through. So as I said back in December, when I was concluding why I would actually be voting on the deal at that time, this is the one way that guarantees we actually do get to Brexit, we can get some of the advantages that people voted for and leave, and honour the pledges we made and I'm to respect the referendum. And that's why I hope that what this House will do next week. Matt Weston. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and it's an honour to follow the member for uh, Torbay. Mr Speaker, I wasn't intending to speak uh, in this debate earlier, but I felt myself compelled to. Uh, just first off, I wanted to mention that uh, the, the Right Honourable Member for North Shropshire, I think he said that the outcome of the, the referendum was actually an advisory. Uh, my understanding from members who were in this place at that time was that, that, uh, that it was actually advisory. It was, uh, it wasn't, was not actually um, a, 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 a straight decision. Uh, but th the reason why we're here today is because there has been a catastrophic failure of leadership and management uh, by one person, and that is the Prime Minister. It has been a complex political and economic uh, disengagement from Europe, but it has not been managed in that particular way. And I'm afraid it really has been down to her. So I cannot, and I'm sure members across this place, cannot sit here and listen to the words uh, describing us or this place as a laughing stock, or that somehow uh, that we are uh, not following the will of the people. Uh, it, it, it seems so wrong. And then to hear the Secretary of State uh, in his opening remarks uh, use the word that we're describing us as frustrating uh, the process, uh, when in actual fact we have been the ones who've been frustrated by a government all the way through, whether it was denying us access to economic impact analyses, which we were told didn't exist or the vote that was supposed to take place on December the 11th, which got pulled. And so it goes on. But you look at a pattern of behaviour from the government, particularly from the Prime Minister, and you just have to look at what happened with Chequers and how the Prime Minister acted with her own Brexit secretary, who she would not share the documents with of her outline proposal for Chequers. And it was not until the day before, as I understand it, that she gave him uh, the, the Honourable Member for Halton Price, access to it. And so it goes on. And you realise that this is not a leader in the true sense who has chosen to take us with her on this project, but one who's acted almost in isolation, alienating us from this process, and has actually sought really to, to plough her own furrow in a way to see through some sort of uh, legacy project uh, when she knew all the way along that there would never be the support for it. And so we've seen a very much a divided cabinet as a result and a divided uh, government. She never sought to engage us and involve us at the beginning of the process. She never sought to scope out what the implications may be with partner countries or with trade unions or with the devolved administrations. So we're now here in a situation where we don't support her. It's almost like, Mr Speaker, and you'll forgive me for using this sporting metaphor,
but she has lost the dressing room. She often repeats the phrase, as does the Secretary of State for exiting uh, the, uh, the EU, that we never state what we're for. And that's because we've been frustrated in the very process or the opportunity to actually say what we would support. And therefore, I would like to echo the points that were made so forcefully and well by the Right Honourable and Learned Member for, for Beaconsfield. We would love to hear or have the opportunity to explore what other options could be considered. And that is what I would call for, is that next week that that opportunity should be revisited in this place, because it is the only way that we will begin to not just reunify this place, but begin to reunify the country, to explore what are the options where we will get a majority for support. And then we can work at somehow resolving this crisis that, that faces us as a country, but also a crisis that faces us. So I would urge us for unity and strength next week that we should support such a proposition, because I believe, and I think it is a, a position that is supported across this place, it is the only we, way we will achieve some way through. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Paul. Mr. Speaker, at this very point in time, I'm meant to be at a reception to thank British MEPs, past and present, uh, for the contribution they have made to political life. And the sad fact is that during my time in the European Parliament, often Labour, Conservative, Lib Dem MEPs from this country work together to find common solutions. This is a very challenging time, but this circumstance was predicted. I recall in the winter just after the referendum, the then Ambassador to Brussels, Ivan Rogers, coming to visit me in my office to talk about what were the last stages of the negotiation likely to be, because he wanted to decide what date he should recommend but should be put on the Article 50 letter. And we discussed how intense the situation would be in the run-up to the European elections and how very often in votes in the Parliament, uh, the first vote, the negotiation does not get through. And it then needs to come back for a few little manoeuvres and extra uh, uh, maybe side agreements, but then it will go through on a second or a third. So we particularly put the March date in order to make sure that if you needed to have an extension for a second or third vote, you would have time to do so before the European elections. This was all predicted. The only thing that Ivan and I got wrong was that we predicted the challenge would be getting it through the European Parliament, not the challenge to get it through here. So let us now look at what is the real deadline. The real deadline is the European elections. Colleagues, I fought a lot of European elections. I fought the one in 2009, in the middle of the expenses scandal. There were 58 Westminster MPs in the area that I campaigned in, and less than a handful were even prepared to show their faces on the streets in their own constituencies. It was toxic. But it is nothing like as toxic as I think it will be if we send go back to our constituents and ask them to fight European elections again. Just think about who you are going to send out as candidates in those elections and what they will face. And I say to the Honourable Member of South Cambridge, who is not in her seat, but says that she wants a second referendum, she wasn't even brave enough to do public meetings in her own constituency in the first referendum. I had to do it. Just think about what that next election would be. I do not underestimate how damaging no deal would be. No deal is not a good deal. If you're a person who's not affected by Europe, it doesn't matter so much to you. But if you are someone who's got relatives living in Europe, if you're married to another EU citizen, if you're in a business that trades with Europe, like the market stall holder on the My Essex market who came to me last Saturday and said, Vicky, we need a deal. I will be bust within a week if we don't have a deal. Then we must find a deal. There is only one deal on the table right now, and it is the withdrawal agreement plus the future partnership. And I say this to the Labour members opposite, please. I've listened again and again, and I know 
that actually your shadow uh, S secretary for Brexit has said the withdrawal agreement is something that fundamentally the opposition don't have a problem with. It's the vagueness of the future partnership and the political declaration you have a problem with. Well, Donald Tusk today has picked his words very carefully. He said this extension is if we agree the withdrawal agreement. He's not committing you to one route or another on the future partnership. So let, that is what Donald Tusk has said in his statement. He said, agree the withdrawal agreement. And then let's take that moment to then work out where we need to land for our future relationship. Because no deal is not in a good place to be in. This is too high risk, and it's too high risk for our constituents. And even though... I would like to have much more clarity on the long-term relationship. I will continue to vote for the withdrawal agreement because I do not condone the damage that it will do to our country and to our relationship with Europe if we let this crash out in a no-deal Brexit. Thank you. Right. Speaker. Um, I'd just like to start very briefly by commenting on something that the Prime Minister said in uh, <laughs> Prime Minister's questions earlier today. She accused the House of navel-gazing on the subject of Europe. And I must say that that is incredibly rich from a party that for the last 30 or more years has spent all its time navel-gazing, or some might say here, digging here. around in their navels, or indeed picking the scabs of Europe, and which has left us in the position we are now in, where it has been always about the uh, Tory interest in relation to Europe and never the interest of the country. Now, I think that's perhaps best reflected in the fact that uh, it has required an SO24 uh, to be granted today to enable us to debate something which the Prime Minister should have brought uh, to this House, and that is the extension that she's seeking to Article 50, particularly given the comments that m many uh, members have uh, repeated that were made about Deputy Prime Minister about how reckless uh, seeking a short extension uh, would be. And I'm afraid to say that the the Prime Minister, in relation to her letter, uh, immediately uh, failed two very basic tests. And first of all, uh, her letter did not explain uh, the purpose of her, uh, the extension she was seeking. But even worse than that, as we heard earlier from, uh, I think, an intervention or the, the, the speech from the member for North Shropshire, the letter wasn't even submitted in time. Uh, the, the level of incompetence of this government uh, is unparalleled. They did not submit in time for other members of you to consider the letter seeking an extension, and therefore it was not possible to consider it at uh, this council meeting. Now, I'm going to say, uh, make it very clear uh, to the minister why the Liberal Democrats, and indeed I think other parties on, on the opposition benches, are seeking an extension to Article 50. First of all, it should be longer than uh, the three months that the government are apparently uh, seeking, and it should be for a very simple purpose. And that is to allow time for, their, for a people's votes to take place. So, there for the Minister, some real clarity uh, on what the purpose of seeking an extension would be. And if that requires European elections to be fought, then we will fight them. And I think that we could well be, perhaps for the first time ever uh, in uh, British history, fighting European elections where we'll be fighting them on the values of the European Union, the principles of the European Union. Yes, on the one hand, of course. We may have uh, Nigel Farage's Brexit party funded by who knows whom from who knows where <laughs> fighting that campaign, but it may well be that the Liberal Democrats, uh, the SNP, uh, the, the Labour Party, one would hope, the Greens, etc., will actually fight the European Parliament elections on the basis of the values of the European Union, here, here. the values that have ensured uh, security, that in ensured peace, have ensured that uh, the EU can deal with issues like climate change together collectively in a positive way. So if we have those elections, then bring them on. We would welcome the opportunity to talk positively about what the European Union has done. Now, Mr Speaker, I'd just really like to, to conclude that there's not very much that, uh, uh, that is positive about <coughs> Brexit. But, but one thing I think, that perhaps the, the silver lining that uh, I hope members uh, of, of nearly all parties, not the DUP, but all the other parties in this place have found, uh, is that actually the, the issue of Brexit has brought parties together, uh, members of different parties together, who often have never worked before, 
in a, a, a sort of collegiate way in, in which we are willing to work together. And of course, that is, as, as I understand it, how, for instance, the Danes were able to get themselves out of the hole that they uh, dug for themselves in 1992 uh, with the Maastricht Treaty, where actually the way they resolved that was to bring the parties together and find a way out of it together. Mm -hmm. That is not what our Prime Minister has done. What she has done, bearing in mind that we are a thousand days since the vote of the 23rd of June 2016, what the Prime Minister attempted, a brief flash uh, about uh, 100 days ago, was organise a series of one-off meetings with party leaders and a series of one-off meetings with, uh, uh, with uh, other, other members of, of those parties. And then she ticked that box, says, oh, I've talked to the other parties, it's all dealt with. Uh, whatever is happening today, I'm not sure whether that will uh, add much to, uh, uh, to, to the sum total of her connections with the other parties, but I see my honourable well, friend wants to give way. So, uh, I, 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 I hear what you're saying about uh, the Brexit situation that we're in, having brought people together from different parties working together. Would you also accept that it has brought people together up and down the country, that we now have in this country one of the largest pro-European movements in Europe, and we will see that in the streets of London this Saturday? Uh, Absolutely. I, I thank her. And I, 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 all I would say on that point is that, yes, and, and we expect that uh, this Saturday, Saturday there will be literally hundreds of thousands of people here uh, coming into London on the People's March. And if we are sitting, if we're sitting on Saturday, as the Speaker has indicated, it might be possible. If, if the Government wants us to sit on Saturday, then I'm sure we'll be able to sit here and listen very carefully uh, to their chance of, of, of stop Brexit. And that is something that uh, I will welcome uh, greatly. <laughs> Mr. Thank, you. Thank you. I do apologise to colleagues, but it is necessary to reduce the time limit to three minutes in order to maximise participation. And I appreciate the Honourable Gentleman for Carefilly's understanding of the situation. Wayne David. Like many people in the country and in my constituency, I am extremely concerned about the situation in which we are in. But I am also clear that responsibility for where we are now rests wholly exclusively with one person, and that is the Prime Minister. Brexit was always going to be a challenge, it is always going to be difficult, but the Prime Minister has turned a drama into a crisis, a political crisis, an unprecedented constitutional crisis. And my advice to the Prime Minister is very simple. You are in a hole, stop digging. We have had two meaningful votes which have been rejected by this House by very large majorities. Both occasions they have been absolutely thrown out, no question about it, and as things stand, if we have a third meaningful vote allowed by the Speaker, that will be rejected as well. And it will be rejected because this House, I believe, is full of honourable members who will not be bullied, browbeaten or bribed. This deal is, in my considered judgment, bad for this country, <coughs> and on that basis I will not support it. And I do ask the Prime Minister to listen very, very carefully to this House and to the country. The country is divided. Of that, there is absolutely no question. But this House is also divided as well. And what we need is not blind dogma and dogmatism. But what we need is an effort by all of us, including the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister especially, to create a consensus for a sensible Brexit, a Brexit which puts the people first and does not put the interest of the Conservative Party above the national interest. And if that consensus about a, what might be called a soft Brexit cannot be achieved, then I think we have to go to the people for their vote. <coughs> and that's why I think there's a lot to be said and careful consideration must be given at this stage and in the very, very near future to a confirmatory referendum. On that basis, I think that we could salvage something out of this terrible crisis in which we find ourselves. I'm extremely grateful to the honourable gentleman. Ben Bradshaw. Mr Speaker, I didn't think uh, it was possible to feel more outrage or more contempt at the behaviour of this government and this Prime Minister. The Right Honourable and Learned Gentleman, uh, the Member for Beaconsfield, said earlier that he had never fe felt so ashamed to be a Conservative MP. Well, let me reassure him, this is not about party politics. I feel ashamed. 
that we have a Prime Minister who is, behave, who, is, who is prepared to behave in this reckless and arrogant way in total disregard of and contempt for Parliament and the majority of views of the people in this country. Yeah. At this moment of maximal peril for the United Kingdom, we have a Prime Minister and a government who resort to trickery, who say one thing to Parliament and the public one day and do another thing uh, the next. I believe most members of this House, Mr Speaker, are prepared to live up to our responsibilities and find a way out of this crisis. If the government doesn't allow us to do that, Parliament will have to do it for ourselves. Yeah. And I would have a message for those ministers we are told in the government who could not under any circumstances contemplate a crash-out, no-deal Brexit, and some of whom might be prepared to tolerate a less damaging, softer Brexit or even a public vote. Next week or the next few days is their chance finally to stand up and be counted and do what is in the national interest. They have been played, they have been had by this Prime Minister. They put their trust in her and she has betrayed them. The next few days will be the moment of truth for them. Will they finally do what they need to do in the national interest to prevent this kamikaze Prime Minister driving this country to destruction, for which she and they will never be forgiven. Thank you very much indeed. Tommy Shepherd. Mr Speaker, without using vocabulary which I think you would find unacceptable, Mr Speaker, I cannot adequately convey the extent of my disgust at how the Prime Minister is treating this Parliament. We are together the elected representatives of the people of the United Kingdom, and yet the Prime Minister has treated us with serial contempt, as has her executive. And this discussion today about the extension of Article 50 is the latest in a long line. There can be no doubt last Thursday that when we voted by a big majority to approve the Government's motion, we were voting to sanction a short extension in circumstances where the withdrawal agreement was approved and a long extension in circumstances where it was not. There is no ambiguity about that point whatsoever. So for the Prime Minister to then seek a short extension without any approval of the withdrawal agreement is to turn the truth on its head and to willfully misrepresent the opinions of this Parliament. So I say to people watching, and I say in particular to the leaders of other European countries who assemble in Brussels tomorrow, that when this British Prime Minister speaks tomorrow, she does not do so in our name and she does not represent our views. We have had a long two and a half years of this Prime Minister refusing to countenance or accept any political view that is not found within the ranks of her own narrow governing party. She has ignored other points of view. She has tried to appease the unappeasable and she, has, she stands accused consistently of putting her party before her country. By now, any reasonable and rational Prime Minister, having faced the scale of defeat over the length of time that she has, would have concluded that either she should leave the terrain altogether, or it is time to go back to the drawing board to remove the arbitrary and erroneous red lines that she set at the beginning and to reach out and try and build a new political consensus in this Parliament and in this country. The fact that she is unable and unwilling to do so is a matter of considerable regret, and I think the people will judge her for it. It is not too late, Mr Speaker. We now need a lengthy extension for as long as it does indeed take to this process in order to begin to create that new political consensus. And my party stands willing to be part of that discussion, although what we will agree to will very much be determined by an ability to put whatever finds a route to a majority in this Parliament again before the people of the United Kingdom to allow them the yeah, final yeah. say. And to those who are hiding behind a distant and narrow mandate, I say to them, what are they afraid of? If they really believe that this withdrawal bill is what 17 million people voted for, then why not put it to them and let them decide? Extremely grateful. Geraint Davis. Thank you very much. We've been given the choices deal or no deal, then deal or no Brexit, and we face a situation now of chaos 
where a million people or more will probably be marching over the weekend to ask for the right for the final say. The government say, oh, we're implementing the will of the people. If that's the will of the people, their deal, they should put it to the people to decide. We can't agree in this place. We voted down this deal by a 230, 149, and often for opposite reasons. One set of people say we're not aligned enough with the EU, another say we are too much aligned to the EU. We can't agree. It should be put to the people. If it represents the will of the people, the people should decide. This debate is about how long the extension should be. I, I put it to the government that we should be allowing at least 22 weeks to allow time for a referendum, five months, probably nine months, so we've got those options. There's a real risk that we'll put forward the idea uh, that the government will go forward without a purpose and we will simply be rejected by the EU, which will then force us into a situation where we'll have to have a no deal or revoke Article 50, and I do very much hope that in those circumstances the Government does choose to revoke Article 50, because the people want to carry on a business as usual and not have a, a chaos. Uh, the situation in Swansea is people who voted leave, voted with good faith for more money, more control, more trade, more jobs, and are telling me now they voted leave not to leave their jobs. They can see they won't get the trade, they can see they won't get the control, they won't get the money. There's a divorce bill. It's complete shambles. They're not getting what they want. You're, they're not, the government is not representing leave voters where I'm from, and they want the final say, and they deserve that final say, and that is what democracy is about. Democracy is the right to change one's mind, and people are dying for that. Keynes, Kane, of course, uh, famously said, uh, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do? The facts have changed. When we had that vote, we didn't have Donald Trump running around threatening people and undermining trade deals, environment deals and world security. We didn't have the Chinese uh, getting rid of their democracy uh, and we will be smashed between these two powers when we try to get trade deals. We need to be part of the values of Europe, of human <coughs> rights, the rule of law, democracy, work together in an uncertain world. And that means staying in the EU. People have woken up to the fact. It's all very well having these stupid sort of populist, oh, take back control and all the rest of it. And people are voting for that. They now realise they're losing control. And to those people who say, oh, well, people will be angry, they'll be absolutely enraged when they lose their jobs. And we're seeing the outbreak of populism and fascism and violence. There was a case that in the Daily Mail now reported of a woman from um, Brexit beaten to a pulp, but she was told, you're from Poland, go home. And we're seeing this. So this is a function of what's happened around Brexit. It must be stopped, and the people demand the final say, and it's a duty to you to deliver it. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It is our job as MPs to speak the truth as we <coughs> see it and to defend the interests of our country and our constituents, in my case, the people of Croydon. But it is very hard, Mr Speaker, to find the words to express the horror, the incredulity and the fear that those of us on this side of the House and many, many opposite feel at the situation we find ourselves in. Nine days until we're due to leave the EU and no plan. The Prime Minister's deal has been voted down in historic proportions twice, and yet she's written today to the European Council setting out her intention to try and get it through for a third time. And of course, we know the Prime Minister's deal was rejected because it is deeply flawed. As the FT said yesterday, although Mrs May's package is called a deal, it's little more than a standstill agreement. She's brought 21 months of armistice in return for indefinite continuation of the conflict. And we know that if her deal did pass, she would be replaced, most likely by an even more hardline leader who would take us even further into isolation and economic decline. So the Prime Minister's deal is something this House could not agree to. It has no legitimacy and it does not have our support. No, Donald Tusk has confirmed this afternoon that, in his view, uh, a short extension should be conditional on the Prime Minister's deal passing. So it's clear that the Prime Minister will try to run down the clock, blackmail, cajole, threaten us into voting for her deal in order to avoid no deal. But it is also clear that this House will not be bullied into voting to make our constituents poorer. No, yeah. Mr Speaker, in her short time in this post, this Prime Minister has done irrevocable, irrevocable damage to the basic principles of democracy and trust and integrity in this place, to our reputation around the world, so great when we hosted the Olympics in 2012, so trashed now, to our economy as business shies away from investment, fearful of what she will do next, 
and to her, our constituents who suffer with low pay, a cheap state and the politics of cut and care nothing. Yes. Mr Speaker, this is very much a live situation with the Leader of the Opposition in talks with the EU trying to decide the best course of action and the Prime Minister ready to make a statement apparently tonight. But we have nine days to avoid no deal and avoid it we must. The Prime Minister must change course. The Prime Minister must shift her position and work across the House to find a solution. The Prime Minister must listen to the Father of the House and hold a series of indicative votes. And the Prime Minister must consider the best compromise in town, the Kyle Wilson Amendment. The Prime Minister must put country before party and at this 11th hour do the right thing. And if she does, we will all thank her for it. Oh, order. Sir Keir Starmer. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank you again for granting this debate this afternoon. Um, the extension of Article 50 is an important issue, and this has been an important debate. Um, and it's one which wouldn't have happened but for this SO24 um, application and debate. Can I thank everybody who's contributed to the debate? There have been some very powerful speeches in this debate, um, and I think there's a clear theme, and that clear theme is a deep concern about a, the course of action that the government is pursuing. It is reckless uh, to seek just a short extension for the purposes of putting the same deal back up and to introduce a new cliff edge uh, at the end of the exercise, and it does increase the risk of no deal, and that's been the constant theme through so many of the speeches this afternoon. It's not what this House voted for last week, both in terms of the, the, the motions that were passed or the spirit of those motions. It's clearly not what this House wants. Uh, I hope the Government is listening to the debate this afternoon, and I hope the Government will, even at this 11th hour, reflect on the course of action and take a different course, which is to recognise that this deal is not fit to be put for a third time, and the alternative course of providing a process so that the House can come together, find a majority, and move forward and break the impasse is what is needed now more than ever. So thank you again, Mr Speaker. Um, it's my privilege to close this uh, debate this afternoon on this important issue. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you very much indeed. Order. The question is that this House has considered the matter of the length and purpose of the extension of the Article 50 process requested by the Government. As many as I have that have been to say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Order. Just before we proceed.